thank you. We're here at the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Uh, I understand that the state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely and are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at the public hearings of council committee are included in the public hearing notice that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now know that the hour has come. Um, Council Member Dom. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Squiller. Uh, for your support of this resolution and for allowing this hearing to occur today. I also want to thank all the co-sponsors, Council Member Gilmore Richardson, Council Member Jones, Council Member Green, Council Member Heenan, Council Member Brooks, Council Member Johnson, Council Member Thomas, and Council Member Parker. I think it's important that we recognize we're at a crossroads in Philadelphia right now. And this crisis for us is a tremendous opportunity to try to provide to the city the right policies and practices. And we want to make sure in doing that, we do not leave anyone behind. Any community that has been left behind in the past, we cannot leave anyone behind. And in the case of our local economy, that's our black and minority owned businesses. It's time we make good on our statements, calling for change by listening, studying, and taking the right actions. Philadelphia is fortunate to have two great resources in our city to help advance this body's legislative agenda, the Pew Char Charitable Trust and the Center City District. Both of these organizations issued reports with very interesting perspectives and research on where things stand now and how we can potentially move forward and get this city back on track in the right way. My takeaway from what I've read is that Philadelphia in general has to start investing in our tax structure and grow the pie, so to speak, as quickly as possible because slicing it up doesn't really help and has not made a difference in the past. Relative to other major cities, you will see Philadelphia overall has fallen behind in job growth and now is the time for us to act. I appreciate my colleagues and council being here today and I'm grateful to the panels we've lined up. This is an opportunity for my colleagues and Philadelphians in general to listen to what the research is showing us and what the experiences of our business leaders in our communities are telling us. So thank you for being here today and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Dom. Mr. McMonagle, will you please call the roll and take attendance? Members, please uh, say whether you're present and say a few words so your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Joan, you're muted. Sorry about that. Councilman Squilla. Present. Councilman Dom. Present. Councilwoman Brooks. Present. Councilwoman Gaultier. Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm here. Councilman Green. I'm present. Looking forward to the conversation. Councilman Johnson. Councilman Jones. Mr. Chairman, I'm present and colleagues. Looking forward to the discussion. And Councilman O. Thank you, Mr. McMonagle. A quorum of the committee is present and the hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development regarding resolution number 200-446. Mr. McMonagle, please read the title of the resolution. Resolution number 200-446 and authorizing the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development to hold a hearing that examined recent research released by Pew Charitable Trusts and Center City District on the John. business economy, the role of our black owned and minority owned businesses me, play in the city's economy and the impact of COVID-19 on these businesses. John. Did I break up? Yes. I don't know. Did I break up? Yes. All right. Can you see me now? 
All right, try it again. I'm only 10 feet from you. <laughs> All right, resolution number 200446, authorizing the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development to hold a hearing that examines recent research released by Pew Charitable Trust and Center City District on the state of our local business economy, the role our black owned and minority owned businesses play in the city's economy and the impact of connecting on these businesses. Okay, that was better. Thank you very much. Uh, before we begin the hearing uh, testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that the public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable ex expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to the recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that they will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized in order to comply with the Sunshine Act. And the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Thank you. We heard Mr. Mr. Uh, Council Member Dom's uh, introduction. So, Ms. McGonagall, will you please call the first panel or witnesses who have to testify this afternoon on resolution number 200466? Sean, you're, you're muted, Sean. <laughs> Sorry about that. The first panel uh, consists of Thomas Ginsburg, Senior Officer of the Pew Charitable Trusts and Paul Levy, President and CEO of the Center City District. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just state your name for the record. Proceed with your testimony. You are able to share your screen to uh, show your presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I am Tom Ginsburg of the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, Pew's Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative conducts nonpartisan independent research and engages with officials on key issues facing Pew's hometown, Philadelphia. Uh, I will share my screen in a minute. Uh, let me introduce this, uh, by start this by saying uh, back in August, we released the first of what we intend will be an ongoing look at private sector businesses in Philadelphia. We focused on small and mid-sized businesses up to 499 employees compared to those in other major cities in a pre-pandemic growth period. These periods, uh, these, excuse me, these businesses comprise an indispensable but often overlooked part of the local economy. Collectively, they are a major source of jobs, but that actually understates their importance. This business cohort is where a majority of people get their first paying jobs. They are providers of goods, services, amenities, and atmosphere. They are neighborhood and community institutions. They build wealth and put assets into the hands of local residents, families, and communities. They are more likely than big companies to be owned and run by people of color. They form the ecosystem from which the next Comcast may emerge, and they tend to be affected by local policies and conditions more than big companies are, making it important for local policymakers to understand them. Our research found that small and mid-sized businesses, I'll sometimes slip into calling them SMBs, just so you know, in Philadelphia at last count before the pandemic, were operating around 23,000 establishments. That was the highest number we saw since at least 1990. Establishments were multiplying in commercial zones outside Center City. Their job growth relative to other cities was especially strong in food and hospitality and healthcare, child, and elder care services. That's the meds part of the eds and meds economy here, which I'll get to a little bit more later. At the same time, we found that pre-COVID Philadelphia had been underperforming 12 other cities we studied on a variety of measurements of small business activity at last count in 2017. SMB's share of the city labor force in 2017 was around 39% below four in 10 jobs and had been falling. In contrast, the median city we looked at was 44% and rising. In other words, SMB net job growth here 
uh, was growing, but not as much as at large companies here and not as much as they were in the other cities we looked at. I'm going to share my screen now here. Wish me luck. All right. Does everybody see that? Yes, Tom. Very good. Great. Thank you. Um, excuse me. I have to get back to it here. Okay. Um, Compared with those cities, pre-COVID, Philadelphia consistently had a low business birth rate, meaning its ecosystem was somewhat less fruitful in, in creating and opening business establishments, including high paying sectors such as professional and technical services. This chart here shows the birth rate minus the death rate. This is the net formation rate over a decade. The higher line, the higher the line, the more growth of mostly smaller businesses. The orange line here is the median of the other 12 cities we looked at. You see generally it was rising since the Great Recession. The green line is Philadelphia, rising more slowly and then sort of plateauing around half to a third below the median. It's probably safe to say this pattern continued in the years leading up to the pandemic. We also looked at um, excuse me, um, finances, financially. Our small and mid-sized businesses as a group were relatively tenuous, uh, as indicated by average gross receipts and the ratings of their business health. This chart shows how punctual or timely businesses in Philadelphia were in paying their own suppliers, their rent, or their other business bills. That's an indicator of their cash flow and their ability to handle financial shocks. The higher this line, the more punctual businesses were in paying those bills. As you see, Philadelphia's SMBs, the green line, as a group, were consistently slower than peers in the median city, the orange line. There were differences in these by sector, of course, and large companies in all the cities were higher than both of these lines. But Philadelphia's consistently slower timeliness was notable. Smaller businesses reflect an area's demographic and economic makeup. We see that in something called business density. That's the, simply the number of businesses per resident. We found that Philadelphia consistently had the, one of the lowest densities among the cities we studied. This chart is a snapshot of 2016 when the density was about 18 establishments per thousand residents 16 and older. Poverty was a factor here. The other cities with high poverty, like Baltimore, also had lower density. In comparison, cities with less poverty, like Philadelphia and Denver, they had almost twice as many small businesses per capita. Why does this matter? More business establishments, everything else equal, can translate into more places where people can get jobs, where owners can build assets, where entrepreneurs can learn and yes, where local government can collect revenue for public services. We also looked at characteristics of small business owners. Uh, in fact, you know, of all business owners. In Philadelphia and in most places, the smaller businesses were much more likely than larger businesses to have black, Hispanic, and women owners. The types of these businesses where they are concentrated, such as food and consumer services, tend to be smaller businesses. The data illustrates this difference pretty starkly for businesses that had employees versus those that had zero employees, such as independent contracting businesses, sometimes that includes gig workers, for example. This distinction is called employer businesses versus non-employer businesses. The chart on the left here shows employer businesses in Philadelphia. 75% of them were owned by white people, 6% by black people, for example. The chart on the right shows non-employer businesses. Only 54% of those were white owned versus 30% black owned. This stark pattern, which was similar for Hispanics and women, uh, uh, I'll, I'll add there, um, was important also 
because most of these smaller and non-employer businesses generated lower revenue and had less economic impact in the city than the employer businesses. Among employer businesses, just among those, minority-owned companies were concentrated, like I said, in lower grossing sectors. In the latest pre-COVID data that we had, Philadelphia's Black-owned businesses had an average $854,000 in annual sales. Hispanic-owned had an average $1.2 million in average sales. In contrast, the average white-owned business took in two to three times as much, $2.6 million on average. As the city talks about recovery now, this is one of the baseline realities that we'll have to contend with. Our report has set a number, um, has another set of numbers, looking at people identifying themselves as self-employed owners of small businesses. That's with or without employees. A lot of these are mom and pop corridor businesses, and sometimes these are considered uh, an indicator of entrepreneurism in the population. We found that Philadelphia of all Philadelphians of all races and genders, including white men, trailed the other cities in self-employment. In other words, Philadelphians overall, by this measure, are somewhat less entrepreneurial than their peers in other cities. Our report uh, also looks at where SMBs primarily sell their goods and services within the region, which is, is known by economists as a local traded or local or a local oriented business, or beyond this region to others around the country or even around the world, which is known as traded. This matters because serving a wider or higher value market outside of the home area can enable a business to grow and bring money back here that otherwise wouldn't have been here. We found a relatively large share of small businesses 81% in Philadelphia were locally focused, such as restaurants and doctor's offices. And 19% were national or globally traded. That includes engineers, financial firms, things, things like such as that. In high growth places like Denver or San Francisco, the split was closer to 65-35, as this chart shows. I get my thing out of the way. Um, one big reason for our business's local focus was that a really large proportion was in the healthcare and social assistance sector, which is locally focused. That's the meds part of the meds and econ meds and meds and meds economy. About 23% of all workers at SMBs were in this sector, more than any more than the median city. These folks were not at big hospitals. They were working at thousands of small doctor's offices, rehab centers, clinics, assisted living centers, child care centers, medical labs, and so on. This meds cluster extends wide and deep in Philadelphia. It's a big reason that other cities had more industry diversity among their SMBs. The fact that these care-related businesses in Philadelphia historically tend to contract and grow later and slower than other sectors is very important to bear in mind going forward. And we looked at the city's net profits tax and its business income and receipts tax, the BERT. We found that SMB's aggregate tax liability for these two taxes alone had been shrinking for a decade, from 2005 to 2017. That was a result of expanded exemptions and tax code changes, like single sales factor, and comparatively modest growth in their, uh, in their gross receipts. As a result, they went from shouldering about 58% of the total burden NPT liability to about 50%. Effectively, Philadelphia had shifted its business tax liability from smaller to larger companies. And because the number of smaller businesses and smaller establishments also had been increasing, like I mentioned, the average small companies' BERT or MPT liability went down from about 3,400 a year to about 2,200 a year. Our report contains uh, many other raw numbers from the tax, from the tax data we uh, collected for policymakers and others to consider. Wrapping up, we found that Philadelphia pre-pandemic underperformed 12 other cities on a variety of measures, business formation, minority ownership, financial health, other measures too. Our, po our high poverty was likely one of the reasons for this. 
But we also found that small and mid-sized establishments had reached their highest number here in decades. And many indicators at that point were still pointing positive before the COVID-19 crash. Thank you for, your, for this opportunity and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Great presentation. I thought there was an echo there, but a great presentation. Um, during the process, and I know now we see some positive changes. Um, do we foresee, foresee that as the fall comes that we would go back down? Um, I'm sorry, back down in, in what exactly do you, are you referring to? Like in our, in our, I guess our, our numbers, I mean, the projections as we saw the city as a whole and saw the challenges that we have, do we, do we perceive the city still on a downward trajectory, I guess is the best way to ask the question. Yeah, well, I, that, that's a very, that, that is a good question. I'm fortunate we don't have the data on what's happening at this moment. Um, it's not, it wasn't part of this research. Um, uh, we do see things that are happening um, with, for example, restaurant reopening and since restaurants and as just one small part of the puzzle was, was a big part of our economy before any any move that, were, that could be made to get them back open would help get that number growing again. Um, it's, it's Philadelphia had a very strong growth in that sector pre-COVID. Um, we built up, in the sense, we built up a lot of strength but that strength instantly turned to liability when they all had to shut down. Uh, so to the extent any of that, and that's a, so that's a very good indicator to watch. Um, yeah, yeah, and I see that uh, Center City District has done some free, newer numbers that I guess we'll have to wait and see how that will play out in the fall and the winter. But uh, Council Member Dom, I have a question. Thank you, Chairman Squilla. Uh, yes, I have a question for a couple questions. Quick ones for Mr. Ginsburg. Thank you for the presentation. It was excellent. Um, and you noted that there were 23,000 businesses in Philadelphia, I think, pre-pandemic. And I guess you don't have any idea where we are right now as, as far as that number is concerned. No, that's, that's a hard one to, uh, to get. We're working on it in various ways, um, and, but that's hard. I mean, there have been some national surveys. A lot of the, that sort of tracking can be done with national surveys, and then you can try to extrapolate back to what's happening here. We can't get that kind of survey at the Philadelphia level, it just isn't the numbers. Okay. I mean, you've seen, we, we've heard some things. So certain kinds of businesses have, um, and you can kind of guess if they had it, if, if a certain kind of business, let, let's say, um, again, going back to restaurants, if they've had a, a 30, 40% decline or whatever the number is nationally, you can kind of extrapolate back. But that's, that, unfortunately, that's the best we can do at the moment. We're working on it. And the, your report focuses on the city of Philadelphia rather than the region of the suburban areas. Any reason why you made that choice and uh, how, how do we interpret that in, in these findings? Yeah, for sure. Well, the economy absolutely is regional. It extends over city borders. Uh, our report has some measures about the region, um, but our team was our, our team at Pew is expressly set up uh, to study issues affecting the city. Uh, that's what that's what I've been instructed to do. That, that's what we're told to focus on. So that's why we focus on it. On this particular topic, I would also add um, that smaller and local businesses um, tend to be affected by local conditions and policies more than larger ones. So on this topic, it's reasonable to focus on what happens within a policy territory like the city of Philadelphia. Okay, two more quick ones. Your findings, which by the way was a great report. What do you think is most relevant to city council? And what do you think we could do in council to help these small businesses recover from your findings? Well, I, as, as much as ever, it's really important to understand how and which smaller businesses start and grow and die. Uh, this is a regular process in business all the time. There's a churn that happens and understanding how and why that happens and particularly what kinds of businesses that's happening to now um, will be really important. It's happening at a higher scale now, we're pretty sure, even if we don't have the exact numbers. Um, we think that our research can help show which industries pre-COVID 
tended to have high and low rates, opening rates, closure rates, that sort of thing already. That's an important context for understanding uh, what happens now. Uh, and it helps, would, would, would help, I would think, know what we're trying to recover to uh, and, and what, what constitutes normal or not. Um, this, uh, the, the industry data that we have, some of it and some of it that others have, uh, will indicate based on those sectors, the level of pay, uh, the equity of ownership in those sectors generally, uh, and their contribution to the general, uh, to the economy of the city overall. So that, that will help you, that will help tell you a lot of it. Okay, and then you had a chart that was talked about traded sectors, I believe. Yeah, uh, which I found I found it interesting. If I recall, the number was like 19% in Philadelphia was traded sectors. We were only, I think, the second lowest of that compared to someone else. And what you're saying is those are the sectors of our business that, I guess, interact with outside of Philadelphia and bring money to our region. And so th those would be valuable businesses for for Philadelphia and our economy. And in your opinion. How could we focus on getting, you know, increasing that traded sector category for the city? Well, the the research, the the research, uh, it, it's our research too. It's not even an opinion. The the research has has borne out what happens with cities that have high percentage or or a high concentration in traded sectors. Their economies operate a little differently. They have more. They may their economy may be more connected to the to the national or even global economy. They're selling services outside their area. They're reaching higher value markets. Uh, that, that might be particularly important in, in a place like Philadelphia that has lower value markets at the scale of businesses um, and, the, and the markets they can reach here may be lower. So to reach higher value markets, more markets to reach outside the city. That's one of the uh, ways this happens. Uh, and our, our data, really clearly showed and actually other data that looks at this also shows that some of the high flying cities again up until the pandemic were those that had very that had much higher uh, traded share of their economy that was nationally global oriented give us a give us an example of a traded sector a specific business that brings dollars to our city uh, I happen to scribbled out a few here um, an example of uh, a traded business would be a professional firm, um, financial firms, architects, um, those that have skills that, that services that they that aren't aren't place locked uh, necessarily. Universities are big exporters. They're traded industries. They bring people from other places here. They also then bring their tuition here that might have gone somewhere else. Hotels. That's probably understandable. People coming from other places come here and spend their dollars here. Uh, other things, information technology, app makers, um, uh, the, the media technologies in general um, are sold beyond the borders of their cities. Wholesalers, obviously, they're selling outside the area. Um, museums are classified as traded. They're bringing people from somewhere else here who wouldn't never, uh, otherwise have been here. Um, what's on the opposite, what's local, you could probably imagine. Restaurants, um, bars, these are all very locally focused. Their customers are mostly local. Um, healthcare is the one that puts us over the uh, down to down or down to 19%. Healthcare and social care are generally categorized as local facing. Most of the of the people they serve come from the community. In, Obviously, when you get to the scale that Philadelphia is with its globally known healthcare centers, hospitals, they do draw people from all over the world. But relatively speaking, most of their most of their business in that sense comes local. One last question. You had a chart that was depressing to me to see. It had to do with black owned businesses. I think that there was two circles. One said 6% when they had more than, I guess, one employee and was 30% for like zero employees. and that, that looked really, can you give that a little more explanation and what can we do to change that? This is that chart. Uh, I could try to share it again. Can I, can I get back to it? Are you still seeing my charts? Yes. Um, it was, whoops, I think I went past it. Was it this one? Yeah. Yes. Um, so th this chart is a measure of businesses. Uh, this simply, this is this is very simply the total number of businesses and what percentage of them are owned by uh, people of a particular race group. 
this does not, this is, this by the way is Hispanic or Hispanic, it mixes that in. We don't have a way to separate those. Um, we, uh, in this chart, I have, a, I could show you a different chart that's just Hispanic. This one, so this is white, Hispanic or non-Hispanic, black, Hispanic or non-Hispanic. Um, uh, this, and again, this is just the city. Uh, it doesn't include the metro. Uh, this reflects partly that 6%, for example, on the, on the left-hand pie. That, is, that reflects, in fact, that's actually slightly higher than it was in the median city, but that's actually reflecting the fact that we have a large African-American community in Philadelphia. Uh, the larger that community is, that, that number should also be higher. Now, 6% doesn't come close to what it is in the population, uh, for sure. It doesn't come close anywhere to the population, unfortunately. Uh, and that's a disparity that's very concerning. Um, when you translate that 6%, when you take into account the size of the population here, that 6% is actually low compared to other cities. Um, when you divide that number, you do some math to it, and you, you, and you actually see what percentages, and I think Paul talks about that in his research. Um, uh, and Paul actually does uh, illustrate that really well, that um, when you're looking at just businesses, that's really just only one way to think of this. You have to understand what proportion these businesses are of the base population. Um, so that's on the left. The, the pie on the right is, is very telling in that um, it really matters also the kind of business you're talking about and the kind of um, the, the sector you're in and the scale and the employees you have or not. And we see, and we've seen this number, the number without employees, the so the, the so-called non-employer businesses. Those were growing all over the country for a couple of decades. This number has been ramping up, and it really grew here too. It grew significantly in Philadelphia as much as it did anywhere else. And and, and this shows, and and we say in the report that this kind of business has become somewhat the locus of entrepreneurship for the for the Black and Hispanic communities to some extent with these kinds of businesses. There's a lot of question as to how you move someone from being a non-employer and essentially graduating to being an employee. Start hiring people, start putting down roots, start building greater wealth. That is a big leap for companies. It's not unheard of and it can be done and it's probably something worth a lot of attention. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Dom. Uh, Council Member Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ginsburg, for your research. Um, uh, this is a important conversation discussion. In particular, um, this week is the Sir Six Annual Minority Enterprise Development Week or Med Week. Uh, so this conversation is very timely. Um, beyond just the reporting of numbers and the data, um, in your work in doing this research. Did you find and did additional resources that other cities that had higher um, levels of successful um, businesses of color had that the city of Philadelphia does not have in reference to technical assistance, access to credit, or other types of investments or uh, opportunities that were provided by either the public or the private sector in those other jurisdictions that are lacking or not at the same level here in the city of Philadelphia? Uh, we unfortunately didn't spend much time looking at that kind of thing in the other cities. That is the right question to be asking to see who has found ways to essentially make up for, uh, in some sense, market failures in the segment of where, where the public sector can step in and provide capital where it otherwise might not might not be there, different forms of capital. Um, we we intend to look at that some more um, going ahead, but this report didn't have it. So unfortunately, I don't have a good, good answer for you there. Okay. Um, are you able to opine, um, although you did not do that research, but based on the data that you saw and looking at some of the trends, could were you able to opine other types of perspectives uh, in reference to the city of Philadelphia and the changes that have occurred in the city of Philadelphia, especially for um, SMBs that are in um, communities of color. You made reference to a, uh, a slide that showed the percentage, I think it was the percentage of BERT um, from 
uh, a few years ago to more recently how that num those numbers have been going down collectively. Um, and that's even during a, a period of growth. Do you have any perspective um, on why that number has been going down? Uh, you're referring to the tax number, the tax liability. Right. Number? Yeah, I think the tax. If you, I guess one. I think it was your last slide um, that you had. Yeah, it was. So this was the, a report. Uh, has right. a numbers. This is only one of the charts in that report. What what this shows is that the uh, again, this is what what businesses are told they have to pay in tax. This is after they've reported their own gross, their own net uh, revenues. They have. Um, you know, posted a year's worth of of of, of sales or, or profit, and and this is what they're reporting to the city on what they will own taxes. So, uh, any tax data you should you look at, you have to understand that the businesses are incentivized to report lower numbers or you know to pay less tax. Um, even so, the changes over the period we looked at here, this was 2000, the period 2005 to seven, which is an average of those years, up to 2015-17, again an average of those years. The total tax that they were told they owed went down as a percentage of the total. The other, the other, the other companies, the larger ones, picked up more of it. Um, this was, from what from what we could tell, we, uh, is was a direct result of a few things happening. The tax code changed. City government, city council changed the code. They right. changed. And, the, and you're, when you say change the code, you're talking about the first hundred thousand dollar exemption. And that probably would have had a bigger impact on small, mid-sized businesses, and that's what may have led to um, that reduction in actual taxes owed. Absolutely, that's absolutely one of the factors. I can't say how much of a factor it was, but it absolutely was one of them. The city also changed the way businesses should calculate their taxes, called single sales factor. It changed mm -hmm. the formula that they're supposed to use. Uh, there were a few other smaller changes that were made, and at the same time, we did we did see. A, a slight, uh, actually only a, a relatively modest growth in what they reported to be their net, their gross sales over time. Um, this was before those exemptions took effect. So some of that it, it was an underlying change in their in their own financial and their business condition, their business their business health. Um, the result was that the, the, the total liability, the total pot that that Philadelphia takes from small businesses decreased um, down to 50 percent. That's the uh, and that again is just burden NPT. Does not include commercial property tax they may have paid, UNO that they might have paid, um, sales tax that they paid to the state, you know, remit to the state, things like that. A lot of other things happening here. Uh, this number you could slice this number in a lot of different ways. They did report uh, changes in their gross receipts um, that you see um, uh, were, like I said, they were sort of modestly growing compared to what large companies reported, their gross receipts more than doubled over that period, reported gross receipts. Okay. Uh, I know in the past when I've either worked with you or with Larry Eichel um, from um, Q and regarding your studies, you tend to do a follow-up um, to dive into some additional information that may have come out of uh, initial study. Do you plan to do that for this type of work? Yes. We, um, we have something in the works now. Uh, we are looking at policy and regulatory uh, moves that cities made in the immediate COVID period. What did they do with their, with the, with their business regulations? Um, I don't have a, you know, a completion time for that and even an ETA. Uh, and we also intend to go back and look at the financing and the access to capital question for right. small. Right, because those are questions access to Credit has been an issue for some time as well as technical assistance. But I think something that would be very helpful in reference to this initial research, because clearly the information provided are information that if you would ask most people that have been involved in this space for a few years or for a long time period could give you anecdotal perspective and are not surprised at all by this information. Um, but the reason I would like to press upon Pew to do that additional follow-up. Um, you may be familiar that the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce is doing a recharge, a recovery um, task force. Uh, the administration has a, uh, a 4R initiative come out of um, the impact of COVID from an economic perspective. And one of the things that I think will be very helpful is that looking at this data 
And the fact that this is information that many of us are familiar with, uh, maybe not the specific detail, but are knowledgeable of this issue. Providing some information and research, especially what has happened in other jurisdictions, that if additional investment is made both on the public or private sector, how that can provide the opportunities for growth in SMBs, especially those that are uh, they're owned by African American constituents as well as Latin constituents in the city of Philadelphia. You may reference to the fact that based on our population, you would think that we would much have a much higher level of successful small businesses. I think that type of data and research um, really would be important going forward because the work that the chamber is doing is not just on how do we be on the defensive of how we're trying to assess what happened to the city of Philadelphia from an economic perspective, but also on the offense. And one of their mission points is to make the city of Philadelphia known nationally, and I believe internationally, as a place where black and brown businesses can come to to thrive. In order for that type of um, statement to be realistic, there's going to be certain uh, action steps taken both in the public sector and the private sector to help that growth. And to the extent that your research can identify what other jurisdictions have done to help make that feasible, I think it'd be very helpful to go be on the offensive and really use and grow our local economy, especially um, people of color in our city, to grow and also attract um, entrepreneurs to the city of Philadelphia. When I think about um, cities like Atlanta, which has had a historical, strong um, African-American business community. But Atlanta has also done some things in other sectors in reference to entertainment and music, uh, as well as film. If you go back 30 years, they really had no type of industry in that regard. But over a period of time, cooperation at the local level from Mayor Shirley Franklin to Mayor Kasim Reed, to now Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, as well as past governors working together to create some of the uh, tax and regulatory incentives to grow that industry, which now you can't see any film or TV show, especially TV, we don't see made in Atlanta. So they were able to create that through policy, and now people go to that city looking for opportunities in reference to film and music. Uh, similar to you have New York and, and LA. So for the chamber to be successful in doing what it's trying to do, um, that type of information and data of what other jurisdictions have been able to do of growing and attracting businesses to help them grow will be helpful for the city. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Green. Um, Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Mr. Ginsburg, uh, for all of your work and for this really important uh, report. And I just wanted to uh, quickly uh, echo the sentiments of my colleague, uh, Councilmember Green, on the importance of ensuring uh, that we are supporting public and private partnerships to uh, further assist uh, the small business and medium business community uh, in Philadelphia. But I wanted to go back to uh, some questions that I had upon reviewing the report, uh, specifically around some of the categories where uh, Philadelphia is lagging. And I know that my colleague, Councilmember Dom, already mentioned the in trade category, uh, but we're also lagging in the supply chain category. Uh, so we have put an important focus on growing local contracting lately, particularly around uh, some of the procurement efforts that we've had uh, in response to uh, COVID-19. Uh, but if the vast majority of our businesses are direct to consumer, are there other programs we need uh, to create more growth in this particular category? The, the, the strategies for growing supply chain part of the economy um, are, are, are varied and they depend really much on uh, the type of industry you're in. Um, you know, if, you're, if, if, if you run a restaurant, um, what, are, what uh, are your possibilities for serving not just retail customers, but perhaps um, taking your best dish and turning around and making it, you resell it to a grocery store who then packages it and resells. I mean, that, that would be supply chain. Um, uh, 
you know, think of hairstylists. There are, I heard, heard stories uh, actually fairly recently of someone inventing a new comb. It was someone ran a barbershop and they invented a new kind of comb and they wanted to produce it and market it to other hairstylists. That's supply chain. So uh, there are ways to, uh, in a sense, pivot from a current B2C focus to a B2B focus. Um, those are hard. Those are hard to do. They take, they take technology. They take knowledge. A lot of uh, expanded, you know, a lot of learning curve for folks who may not have done that. The the other way that and probably for the cities that that have a lot of a higher share of supply chain economy uh, businesses, uh, they start out that way and they end up having strength already in those types of things. And so think of like Silicon Valley. We think of Silicon Valley. Well, what is that? Those are a lot of businesses that started right off as supply chain businesses. The whole business model is supply chain from the beginning. Now, that's a different challenge. That That's a matter of, of education. Uh, that's a matter of training from the beginning. That's a matter of uh, equity capital uh, to invest in those kinds of businesses. Um, um, the first way, uh, Pivoting from a B to, uh, from B to C to B to B. I'm sorry, <laughs> using these acronyms. From biz, from business to consumer, switching to business to business, uh, which, by the way, includes business to government. Um, uh, the um, that um, is a way to expand, uh, become more resilient in an economy. If one, if you lose a customer one place, you might have them somewhere else. That expands your world of customers, um, in a sense. So um, those require just very different, very specific things. Our study didn't look at that specifically. This study didn't. Um, uh, there's quite a bit of material on it. I can certainly try to uh, get some and follow up with you if you want more of it. Yes, that would be most helpful. And I just wanted to say uh, on the record uh, that I appreciate the Commerce Department for offering uh, programming to businesses uh, during this time that address how to pivot and uh, better utilize technology to help market your business. Uh, so I think that'll be an important part of some of the work that we can uh, do and also offer uh, to small and medium sized businesses in our city. Uh, but really quickly, I have one additional question uh, related to um, our lagging in entrepreneurship. So your report also uh, noted that uh, capital access and the high rate of poverty are reasons that we're lagging uh, in entrepreneurship. And the Commerce Department was preparing an entrepreneurship ecosystem study uh, to determine the current support systems for entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs of color. Um, so have you all been connected to that work? And uh, what are the main systems or policies that you think uh, would most impact entrepreneurship growth in our city. Uh, yes, we are connected. I'm aware. I think uh, of the of the work that you you refer to. I think the United Way is involved with with some of that, if that's the one. Um, and yes, we've connected with them. I think that's all. It seems very promising, and and what they've set out to do uh, should help a lot. Um, again, since since we didn't study this, and we actually made a decision not to go into the the startup entrepreneurial side in depth, that is a that's actually very specific and and required you know, it merits a lot of this you know analysis on its own. Um, I could say that what other research has found, uh, Kaufman Institute for one has done a lot of this research. What they have found is one of the biggest distinguishing factors from one city to another or from one metro area to another when it comes to startup rates is very simply the level, level of education and the amount of people in the population who have higher education of any kind. That, that, that is the biggest correlating thing. In fact, some cases more than availability of, of capital. It is, it is how, much, how much education you have in the, native, in, in the population. And that, is, that means that the implication there is what you're doing is you're building from what you have. You're not attracting businesses from other, other places. You, Places that have the education there um, do better in that regard. So uh, Philadelphia has had uh, a relatively low percentage of its population college educated for a while. Uh, and that is one of the many factors behind what we see in these numbers. OK, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It makes sense. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Gilmore-Richardson. Uh, Councilmember Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
and thank you for pulling together this important uh, body of work. A uh, couple of things. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, actually go to Israel, uh, and one of the things that they pride themselves on is startup businesses, entrepreneurship, and the synergy uh, between both the universities, the government, and then entrepreneurial opportunities that are provided. Uh, my first question is, do we have that synergy here in Philadelphia with our eds and meds and small business opportunities? I, I don't know the, the exact answer to that. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting point. Israel is a small country and they operate at a whole different scale than, you know, than, than differently than a city does. Um, um, the, um, uh, the, the healthcare, our dominant, our dominant sector, and as we learn, the dominant sector vertically too, that, that the small companies are also dominated in the healthcare and social service sector, uh, is, is notable in, in that um, it, it, reaches, it reaches pretty far in Philadelphia. We even did a geographic uh, map of it, and it's spread in a lot of corners of the city. Uh, and that is the SMBs working in healthcare and social, social assistance. Um, the extent to which they actually integrate and, and co-strategize with, with local government, with local policymakers, with other sectors, we didn't investigate that. Uh, it's, it's probably worth investigating. Uh, uh, it is, it, since it is our strongest sector in comparison to the other cities, it's certainly strong, that um, certainly would merit some of that, I would think. Post-pandemic, um, and one of the lessons learned, or should have been learned, is that we relied too heavily on foreign government governments for health necessities in those relationships with our hospitals, whether we talk about PPEs or ventilators, is there a, should there be a strategy so that that never happens again and that we locally source some of those kinds of uh, opportunities to distribute and um, have supplied those types of um, essential uh, uh, post COVID-19 because the way mother nature plays, there'll be a COVID 20 and 21 that we need to be braced for. So are, are there lessons learned on how to generate local opportunities for post COVID businesses? And, and what do I mean? not just by PPEs, but the whole idea of how we do um, microbial treatment, cleaning, maintenance has changed drastically. Uh, SEPTA alone uh, went from one cleaning of their trains to three a day. And that janitor that used to um, clean it with a mop and a bucket and a, and a rag in their back pocket no longer does that. And are, the, are we looking at companies that can take advantage of, of you know, the, the evolution of businesses since COVID? Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. There, it, every, every crisis among, among other things creates opportunities for sure. And, and for businesses that can capitalize that on that and, 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 and hire, and that's, that's certainly a, a, a possibility. We didn't look at it in any detail like that. We didn't look at what's happening in the COVID period. Um, well, we one of the things we do find in the data coming up to up to uh, up to 2017 was Philadelphia's manufacturing capacity had really deteriorated a lot. It was this is obviously an old story, but we found in the data that it just continued. Uh, and in fact, other cities turned around their manufacturing sectors more than we did. Uh, uh, after the Great Recession, uh, so so just to respond to your point about manufacturing PPE equipment, that requires a manufacturing base that exists. Um, we just looked at the city, and and what we saw is Philadelphia's manufacturing capacity um, did not recover like others did. So, um, is that the right place to put the emphasis? Does that mean it needs more help, or that means maybe you, you better serve somewhere else? I don't know. I, 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 we also found in our in our report um, that Philadelphia is, and this is also no surprise, 
We are, um, we are a leader in biotechnology and in other forms at the, higher, you know, at the other end of the, of the healthcare spectrum um, of, the, um, of, of that part of the, and obviously that serves a different uh, worker base that doesn't provide jobs the same way. To the so what about COVID testing, labs, things like that? Uh, we didn't look at that that specific function, that specific capacity. We just don't, we don't have that. We didn't look at that. I could so, we take a look uh, and get back. So look, I'll move on, but um, let's go with commercial corridors versus center city. Um, it's my understanding that restaurant in center city are coming back, but coming back slowly. Is that correct? Uh, I'm going to defer to, to my friend Paul Levy. He would know that much better than me. And, and I just got off of the phone uh, with one of my uh, friends in Main Street, Manion. They, since COVID and since the city's restrictions have eased a bit, they've taken full advantage of outdoor dining, similar to what they're doing in media uh, when they close streets. And they, to the point, Mr. Chairman and, and colleagues, that they want to uh, expand the regulations and make permanent certain uh, closures so that they can continue that trend uh, of, of uh, outdoor dining. So, so in one way, the center city loss, forgive me, Paul Levy, is Main Street's gain. Well, we see in the data that, that 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 those patterns have been, from one perspective, it's it's pretty solid. Center City has been the dominant central business district for a long time, and there's no risk that that's going to change. What we're talking about is really at the margins, and some places have 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 absolutely come up and grabbed a bigger share in that sense. Uh, and that was again pre-pandemic, and so we'll see what happens now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chair. If I can add a point of information. Yeah, Councilmember Green. Yeah, um, Councilmember Jones talked about cleaning and other type of sanitation initiatives um, that have created some opportunities for businesses, especially African American owned businesses. Um, this is a point of information. I have been part of a small and small diverse business community task force um, that got started, um, I believe it was in late April. Uh, I've been meeting weekly. Um, that is chaired by Mike Brown, an entrepreneur who's been working on FEMA activity based in Philadelphia, but he's also done a lot of FEMA work in Florida, along with Kerry, Co Kerry Kirkland uh, as part of Governor Wolf's staff. Um, that task force includes uh, former Commerce Director Harold Epps, Joanne Bell, Della Clark, um, George Burrell, a number of other people that have been involved in entrepreneurial activities. And what the task force has done has acquired and licensed a sanitation cleaning system and been working with various African-American entrepreneurs in the region, um, many that you know from the Donna Ali's and others, to give them the ability to use that licensing system to procure additional work as part of the FEMA initiative to help provide sanitation and cleaning um, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Some of you may be familiar with the demonstration that was on SEPTA buses um, sometime this summer. That was part of the task force's work. They've also been doing sanitation uh, in Pittsburgh as well as Harrisburg. So they're focusing on Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, and Philadelphia to provide opportunities for African-American owned businesses to have this licensing to be able to get some of that federal work that they may not have been able to get access to and as a result have been able to hire people um, based on that access. So I just want to provide that information uh, for Council Member Jones and I can put the um, website in the chat feature. Mr. Point of Information for my colleagues, Point of Information. <laughs> Council Jones. One of you, um, and thank you for that work, uh, Member Green and um, as we look to these opportunities, uh, one of the unfortunate uh, impacts of COVID was uh, they hit hard in our prisons and they hit hard in our senior facilities. 
uh, they were kept, literally captive audiences in both cases that were hit hard. And one of the things that um, the prisons are, have evolved to is a quick chill process, which the chain of custody of people's food has to be documented because bioorganisms and pandemics post COVID, you have to be able to trace that so that you minimize the exposure to your uh, people that you are to care for, uh, whether it's a senior citizen or an inmate. So as we look at these licenses that you mentioned, Member Green, that we we need to we need to make sure that there is equal access to those licenses. Because in the quick chill instance, there's only a couple of universities that certify companies in that process. So if you aren't certified in that process, you can't bid on that that work. And so we have to constantly be vigilant to make sure that you don't create monopolies on, on technology and processes. So thank you, Member Green, for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Is there any other questions uh, pertaining to that presentation? Seeing none, Mr. McMonagall, do you want to uh, call the next presenter? Yes, our second panel consists of Sylvie Gallier Howard. Wait, wait, I think um, I think we have um, Paul Levy. Oh, I apologize, Paul. Paul, uh, Paul, just state your name for the record and then proceed with your uh, presentation. Sure, I, I've tried to, sh I've, I've shared my screen. Do you see it at this point? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, thank my you. name is Paul Levy, president of the Center City District, and thank you very much for this opportunity. And, and Councilman Green, I hope to answer a couple of the questions and also the ones that you raised, Councilman Squilla. I'll do this very quickly because we've looked at very similar data, but we looked at it from a different perspective from the Pew work. Uh, and so we looked at business density, particularly in the city and compared it to several other cities. We analyzed the total number of firms in Philadelphia plus the number of black, Hispanic, Asian and white firms and then compared it to four other cities, including Atlanta. We created this simple measure of business density, the ratio between the number of firms in a city and its population. And that gives you a measure of opportunity. The higher of ratio of firms to residents, the more potential their opportunity there is. And then we look specifically at the ratio of black owned firms to the, the black residents, as well as Hispanic and Asian. So in the simple message is more businesses equal more job opportunities, more black owned businesses equal more jobs for African Americans. And I'm gonna start with the really bad news, which our report highlighted. Across the country, there are obvious and well-known disparities between the total number of white owned and majority owned businesses and black owned businesses in all five cities. But the disparities are greater in Philadelphia. That is worse in Philadelphia. We have the lowest number of black businesses per black resident of the cities that we looked at, Atlanta, New York, Boston, and Washington. Atlanta's already been cited. The business density among black businesses there is two and a half times the density as in Philadelphia. But more significantly, at the same time, we have the lowest density of all businesses of all five cities. So for all businesses, the business density in Atlanta is two times the density in Philadelphia. Boston is one and a half times. This corresponds exactly just to show that Pew chart again, the lowest density of small and medium sized businesses, the slowest rate of business formation. But the work that we did was looking at it separately by ethnic and racial group. And this chart from our study is incredibly disturbing because it shows among white businesses, we have the lowest density among the five cities. Among black businesses, we have the lowest density. Among Asian businesses, our number of Asian businesses is slightly ahead of Boston, as you can see, but behind the three other cities. Similarly, Hispanic businesses trail. This then translates into the fact that all of our businesses lag in average revenues. That means they make less money than comparable businesses in other cities. They trail a number of employees, which means they create fewer jobs. 
We have less business density in the city as compared to the suburbs. Atlanta has 140% the density of businesses in the city versus the suburb. We're almost reversed. 143 business, the density of businesses in the suburbs versus the city in Philadelphia. Fewer jobs per resident in the city versus the region is a particular challenge, as we all know, for residents without cars. Now, our suburbs have also grown more family sustaining jobs. Only 26% of the jobs we grew between 2009 and 2018 paid between 35,000 and 100. 62% of the jobs in the suburbs were in that range. This is not a city versus suburbs. The 25 largest cities also grew a far larger share of family sustaining jobs than did Philadelphia. This is one of the reasons why 42% of the residents of each of your districts are reverse commuting to where the jobs are in the suburbs. And that obviously represents a risk for people to choose to move there. As a result, our workforce participation is the lowest, 37% of adults. You can see the workforce participation rates in other cities. So the conclusion we reach very simply is no surprise that black owned businesses in the city face a huge barrier, but it's a double barrier. Not only the historic legacy and its continuation, but the limited business density in the city as a whole. So if we have one simple recommendation, which I'll elaborate on, is that if we want to reduce unemployment and poverty as this health crisis ends, we need to get back to much more than the status quo. We're going to need a significantly larger number of black owned businesses and far more robust job growth across the entire city. Uh, this was just briefly talked about. If you look at this, only five of Philadelphia's 20 largest employers are in the private sector. We do have a very strong strength in healthcare. It's something we should be proud of. But what low business density also means is we lack a lot of other private sector businesses. And if you look at a Comcast, that's a traded industry. They are selling nationally. If you look at some of these other firms, they are trading nationally low business density across the board. If you look back to the Pew report, the strength among minority businesses and small businesses exactly reflects the strength of our overall community. We are strong in small businesses where we're strong in hospitality and strong in healthcare, but weak in other places. So quite simply, no surprise, black and minority owned businesses do not exist in a vacuum. When we think of neighborhood commercial corridors, clearly those retailers and service firms are selling into their local communities. But when expanding small and medium sized businesses succeed, they're succeeding because they can track with providing services to larger businesses in the city and region and ultimately selling outside. So Philadelphia's slow growth and low density of firms of all kinds creates a problem for black and minority owned businesses, but that's a similar problem across the entire city. So I'm suggesting we rise and fall together on this issue. We hosted a meeting last week or a week and a half ago in which we invited in the president of the US Black Chambers. We had several other speakers you know well and Stephen Scott Bradley, Della Clark and Jerry Sweeney. And the core recommendations that came out of that were no surprise. Number one, two and three said our speaker from Washington was greater access to affordable capital for startups and for the expansion of black and minority businesses. The second recommendation was greater emphasis on the public sector and, and on business development and entrepreneurial capacity building, less emphasis just on job training and social services. Councilman Green, you asked this question in fiscal year 2021, Washington DC will spend $6.60 per capita on small and minority business development. We in Philadelphia are spending 59 cents per capita, New York 92 cents, Boston 343. So how we choose to spend public sector money matters, but the private sector has 
it's a role and obligation here to have a much more intentional strategy, which I think is one of the fortunate silver linings that has come out of this pandemic as people have realized how negative the effect has been on black and brown businesses. So greater contracting in the private sector, but that fourth point, a more robust climate for private sector job growth overall. Let me just elaborate on a few of those points and then quickly open to questions. The public sector itself, this is an analysis of our city budget. We are spending 50% of our entire budget on public safety, courts, social services. Very, very important issues. If you add in employee benefits, we're up to three quarters of the budget being spent on those social service, criminal justice, and safety issues. We're spending only 13% of our budget on economic development, quality of life, parks, sanitation, and education. Equally an important effort. In the last 20 years, we are spending on social service, police, courts, and employee benefits while we have, have reduced economic development, culture, and recreation. So we're not investing sufficiently, in my judgment, in the economic development functions. No surprise, I think there's a role for tax policy here as well. This is showing all the way back to 1996, suggested for how much money was set aside in each year's budget to lower wage and business taxes, which was done very successfully from 1996 all the way to 2010. It represented an average commitment of $19.3 million a year devoted by you, city council, to tax reduction. That was never more on average than a half of 1% of all general fund expenditures. In the 2019 budget, look way over on the right side of the chart, it was down to one tenth of 1%. And as you know, you had to completely eliminate that. Clearly, we're in a situation that I think affects these numbers. When there's a wage tax of 3.8% in the city compared to zero or 1% in the counties, that creates a competitive disadvantage. Our wage tax is four times what it's going on in the suburbs. Our business income and receipts tax, which you have exempted small businesses, but note that it has actually increased the burden on larger businesses. That's not a gain if our larger businesses aren't growing and if they're not also contracting with smaller businesses. So I think tax policy has a role here as well. So a simple recommendation, you know, as we come out of this pandemic is to place a greater emphasis on both economic development, fully recognizing our social service issues and a greater focus on tax competitiveness for all. The other points I simply want to make really go to what do I mean that we have to do more than just rebound. Philadelphia suffered, as you know, a very, very long decline. We lost 286,000 jobs from 1970 to 2010. As we lost those jobs, we added 100,000 people in poverty. But the poverty rate went up so dramatically as well because we lost a half a million middle income and working class residents. People who used to live in our neighborhoods who moved to where the jobs are, which is in the service. The rebound we were in before this pandemic almost got us back up to 1990 job levels. So it's been a lot of positive development, but we're still 22% below our job levels of 1970. Boston and New York also lost about the same amount of manufacturing jobs we did. Boston today, just before the pandemic, was 27% above their 1970 job levels. New York, 17% above their 1970 job levels. Philadelphia down 22%. This ought to be a reason for extraordinary impatience on all of our parts. Because we failed to replace those manufacturing jobs, that to me is one of the primary reasons why we have this dubious distinction of the highest poverty rate of the 10 largest American cities. I don't have to tell each of you that in some of your districts, the poverty rate rises above 40%. Quite simply, poverty is not a failing of people in poverty. It's an educational issue, but it's also a failure of Philadelphia to produce enough jobs and to create enough new firms. Small business development, medium-sized business development is a poverty reduction strategy. We did it really well coming out of the recession. 
We grew at 1.5% a year, but look at the 26 other largest American cities. They grew at the rate of 2.4% a year. We grew, but we grew slowly. In March, we were entering our 11th straight year of job growth. We had added 84,000, almost 85,000 jobs, and we started very strongly, and then came the pandemic. To answer Councilman Squilla to your question is we lost 36,400 jobs in food service up through August and up through uh, June. That was a 65% loss. We've gained back 13,700. So we are, as you can see in the blue line, slowly gaining back jobs citywide, but we have not gotten back up to where we were in March and we can't simply rest there. We obviously need much greater small business development and large business development. So I'll end here that just as black businesses face a double challenge, so does Philadelphia in recovery. We need to rebound, but we need to grow faster and more inclusively than we did in the last decade. That means a much greater growth of black owned businesses, brown owned businesses and businesses of all kind. And I think we as a city need to commit to make job growth job number one for all of us. So let me stop there and just open to questions. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Uh, for that presentation um, and thank you for answering my questions. Right. Um, obviously, uh, we see the gain and but again, I think uh, how that gain it will it continue, will it subside depending on how the fall and winter goes, uh, whether the virus or flu season comes back stronger. Um, I think the challenges are still will still remain. So right. um, we're still in doubt, but uh, I think this is very helpful moving forward on how we're going to proceed. Um, uh, Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Paul, uh, so much for that very compelling testimony. And I just wanted to go back to uh, something you noted in your presentation around Philadelphia having the lowest percentage of residents who work full time, as well as the largest percentage of people who do not work. Uh, and then also compare that to uh, number two of your recommendations list as a result of the meeting you had last week uh, with some of the African American business leaders around placing a great Greater emphasis uh, in the public sector on business development and entrepreneurial uh, capacity building, but less on job training and social services. Uh, can you talk more about that? Uh, because for me, I feel as though workforce development will be a very important part to uh, how we, uh, you know, help individuals uh, reskill and upskill uh, as we move through and beyond COVID-19. So, could you just talk about that a little more for me? Sure. I think, again, the, the emphasis that came clearly from all three speakers was access to capital was number one. That is, and, and as I said, uh, Ron Busby from Washington said that was number one, two, and three. I mean, clearly that is the paramount issue uh, at this moment, not only for startups, but for businesses to expand. That, that second point, as you may recognize, was one that Della Clark makes very frequently. She wasn't necessarily criticizing job training, but I think what she was saying is if we only look at this as job training and don't have a growing base of jobs, we're preparing people for jobs that aren't here. So I don't want to suggest it's an either or, but to say when you saw those numbers of how much more now, Washington has in its own way the advantage of having both minority contracting at the city level and at the national level. What Atlanta has that we don't have is a much more robust private sector that's made a stronger commitment to minority contracting as well. But my basic point, and I think this point of those speakers was not that job training doesn't matter, but if you only focus on job training without a parallel or frankly greater emphasis on business development, you know, we're preparing people to take jobs in the suburbs at this point. Right, and that's going to be each of your constituents is moving away to those opportunities. So it was really a call for exactly what this hearing is about, which is how do we grow more black, brown, minority-owned businesses in the city? 
Okay, thank you for that response, because my follow up for that is how are we looking at uh, the new data and research around the labor market indicators that we'll see to try to help grow businesses in those industries? Is that currently happening? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll let Sylvie answer the question exactly how the city's looking at that, but clearly there is a, you know, there's several different ways to look at this. You can train for the jobs that we know we have in this city, or you can also say, what are those industries we want to attract that pay family sustaining jobs that are in the region that we want to get here? I think we need to do both. I mean, I think we need to be attracting businesses and training for them. But my core point here is when you have slow job growth, when you have low business density, if you're only spending money on job training, we're not solving the problem we have. Thank you so much. And just one last question, sure. because you mentioned also in those recommendations uh, that capital access and local support for minority firms will be crucial, right? So you know that we've been working really hard to ensure a strong access to capital and opportunities throughout the emergency uh, business relief programs in the right. city. But have you seen any or uh, any preliminary data on the effectiveness of these programs and keeping minority owned businesses open? Um, and really with our limited ability to invest in new programs uh, due to uh, what we know will be extraordinary uh, budget constraints. Uh, can you recommend ways to improve those type of programs or policies or uh, any tax incentives that we already have to ensure we are meeting the needs of business owners of color? Sure, well, the, the first answer is the only local data is available up through August. We don't yet know September. And, you know, I think the, the, the numbers across the board are suggesting, you know, that I would say we're halfway through recovery. You know, just on to take restaurant and food services, you know, we were down 65%. We're maybe now back up at probably 60 to 70% capacity before. So we're on a rebound, but it's a fragile rebound, as we said in the report we put out there. I, I think on the issue, I mean, let me get back to you in terms of looking, because we've been starting to look at what other cities are doing well. And that was one of the things that I think Ron Busby was very helpful from the Black Chambers to say, here are examples of cities that Philadelphia can learn from. Okay, thank you so much. I'll definitely be interested in receiving that information. Thank you. I think that'll Glad be vitally you. important to have as we move into our next budget season. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, members, and uh, Gilmore Richardson. Um, Council Member uh, Alan Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Paul, for your presentation. A couple quick questions for you. I just want to make sure that we're really clear. In your study, you you looked at five different cities, I guess. Right. right. And some of these, the numbers are just shocking to me that, uh, you know, there's a chart you have, I guess, shows the disparities in the business density, number of businesses per resident. And I think Atlanta has black owned businesses at 4.7. Is that per thousand? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And we're at 1.8. I mean, we're like two and a half times. It's really low compared to these other cities. But then we're also compared to overall businesses, they're at 24.6 and we're at 12.1. So I guess this chart, which is what you've been saying, is the messaging is we're really bad in, in the minority business, but we're really bad across the board. This is just across the board problem. Yeah, I, I look, I think we went into this study clearly knowing there was a, a national problem of disparity of the volume of black and brown owned businesses compared to the overall number of businesses in any city. We were startled to find how Philadelphia, we picked you know five East Coast cities uh, and it was Boston, New York, Washington, and Atlanta. We were startled to see that in almost all categories, we were lagging behind in all of those. But I think for me, the takeaway was that the problem is worse in Philadelphia because the overall business climate is worse in Philadelphia. I mean, if you talk to any startup business, they're not simply, I mean, apart from a restaurant, they're gonna get their next customer from the next bigger business or somebody they may contract with in the downtown. If our center city economy is not growing as vibrantly, if our university city economy is not growing vibrantly, there are not as many contracting opportunities. And so I think 
you know, part of this to me is that we have, as I said, we have a dual problem. We have the historic barriers of racism for black and minority owned businesses, but we have the Philadelphia slow growth problem layered over that. And so we need to solve both problems simultaneously. And as you know, I believe clearly creating a more competitive business environment, not the sole solution, but a key part of that solution. And I guess the other the other chart that's concerning, Paul, is that you compared these five cities, suburbs versus the city. It looks to me like on this chart, we're the only city where uh, I guess our business growth is far below the suburban growth. Everyone else's cities. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the big surprise to me because I mean, I've been in Atlanta multiple times and I appreciate what they're doing there. But I have a kind of biased image of thinking of Atlanta as the Los Angeles of the East Coast. That is a sprawling, auto dependent, everybody out in the suburbs. And I was stunned to see that the business density in the city of Atlanta was greater than, it, than its surrounding suburbs. And we were the reverse. I mean, we think about ourselves as a dense city and we are, but when you realize the number I quote all the time is that 53% of all jobs in Philadelphia are either in center city with 42% or university city with 10%. That's at the center of the transit system. That's a great center of opportunity, but that means there are most other neighborhoods in the city without much job density. So those disparities are huge here. So we have high density in the core but then we really thin out in terms of job opportunities, which is why we have such high unemployment and poverty rate in our neighborhood. So we need business development citywide. And it's not a matter of one or the other, we need both. So Paul, advice to myself and my colleagues on how we can help this situation. I know you mentioned investing in our tax structure and you showed right. a chart going back to, I think it was 1996 if I recall. Right. And it showed how much money we have invested before. And you know, I, I look at that as saying that's investing in the city of Philadelphia because you're investing in the taxes for long term growth of building your base. And we've kind of gotten away from that. Uh, so are you suggesting that this council look at how we can invest in the tax structure in order to bring back the, you know, better numbers than what we're seeing today? Yeah, I mean, the report that we released just before the pandemic, which was called investing the proceeds of growth, basically said, look, you as legislators, the mayor, Broadly speaking, there are three priorities. We've got to address need and poverty and deterioration in the city. We call that strategy one. But two, we need to address quality of life, what keep residents and business he here, that's sanitation, that's parks, that's education. And then three, we need to address the competitiveness of the city. All three of those are important priorities and no one would say that one is more important than the other. But what we found is, and I fully understand it. I mean, you're in a position where each of you in districts, uh, neighborhood districts are, are confronting profound poverty. And you obviously need to address that through services. But this report was basically saying if we only, if we're spending 50% on services, 23% on pensions, they only have 13% less for left for economic development. It was increase that share that goes to economic development, recreation, that goes to cleaning streets and increase that share that goes to tax reduction. You need to do all three. It was essentially slightly altered the balance. Not that we don't have compelling need, but if you only try to meet the need without also stimulating growth, we're not going to get out of the bind we're in. All right, listen, thank you very much for the thank important you. testimony today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Dom. Uh, Councilmember Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Paul, for your testimony. Um, just have a, a few quick questions. Um, when you show the information on Boston and New York and reference to manufacturing, and they were up significantly from their right. 1970 levels, whereas Philadelphia was still 22% uh, below, what type of manufacturing did those cities have? Yeah, I, I think, well, the, the, the bigger point was, you know, New York had a huge garment industry. New York had a huge waterfront of employment. It had a printing industry. Boston had huge food manufacturing, shoes, boots, et cetera. My point was, though, that Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, as traditional Rust Belt cities, all lost between 85 and 90 percent of the manufacturing jobs they had in 1970. That's been the fate of all of these cities. We've suffered from that hugely. 
But what those cities have done is grow post-industrial jobs at a much faster rate. My point was that we can't use the excuse, if you will, that, oh, we lost a lot of manufacturing jobs. So did those other cities. They did a better job of growing other industries and other jobs. That was the point that we've got to be able to look forward now and say, how do we grow in a more robust fashion? Uh, you made reference to a number of uh, points in reference to hospitality and healthcare. And right. the fact, when you look at the top employees in our city, uh, many of them are nonprofit institutions right. as compared to other cities where for profit. Uh, considering we have such a strong eds and meds infrastructure in Philadelphia, and we've been known for that, and what are your thoughts on looking at that sector as a way to grow? Um, businesses, especially um, businesses of color, African American owned businesses. And there's the Anchor Procurement Initiative that the Common League has. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts about using a sector we are known for and using it as a bridge to grow in the city of Philadelphia and then grow in the region and grow across the country? You know, I've had the honor of serving on the Philadelphia Convention of Visitors Bureau for a long time, and that's an industry that very intentionally said we want to create opportunity for minority firms or black firms. And we've done a very good job there. We've got a whole council that is focused on creating opportunities. So my point is when we're intentional about this, we can succeed, but we're succeeding in sectors that are also growing. Similarly in healthcare and education, that's a great strength. I don't wanna minimize that. And clearly what the Economy League is, is a ver doing is a very good model. You wanna capitalize on your strengths. I had no means, did not mean to in any way minimize that. My point was that we lack so many other private sector firms, which is why we have such lagging small businesses in those sectors too. That was my statement, we rise and fall together. We can't solve minority and black owned business development without a more robust economy. We can't have a robust economy only among white people and have huge disparities in the city. We've got to solve both at the same time. So what we've done in hospitality is a model. What is being proposed in healthcare is a model. My point was that where are all the other private sector industries that are not in health? care. That's where we're weak. Okay. And I have this last point, because I know we've talked about this issue over the years, and you made reference to it within your presentation about tax policy. Uh, and, you know, we have a uniformity clause issue in reference sure. to how we tax businesses from large businesses and small businesses. Um, but we still have some ways that we can address that at the local level um, by making cuts in um, taxes. Um, however, the challenge is that you have a good section of our local economy from a public policy debate would argue that doing that type of cut or investment in reducing taxes does not benefit the city as a whole, especially those in poverty. What would you say to those who would say that well, if you do any type of tax cutting, um, that's only going to benefit those who already are benefiting from our economy and not really help those who are impoverished um, and it won't really create jobs in the city of Philadelphia. I, I, let's just focus on the wage tax. That's a regressive tax, right? That's not a progressive tax. So a working poor person is paying a wage tax unless they're able to take advantage of some of the federal programs there. So, you know, to me, the wage tax is a barrier to putting pocket money in the pockets of poor people, of middle class people, let alone of rich people. So I don't think it's a redistributive tax by lowering wage tax. So I think you're helping everyone in this economy. Council has recognized that the business improve the business, sorry, I was going to call it business privilege tax, the business income and receipts tax is a barrier. You have made major steps in exempting small businesses. And the point I think that was being made by the Pew study is you've lowered the burden on those businesses, but a study we did showed they hadn't grown very much. And it's, it's not that you weren't doing the right thing, it's they were trying to sell into a static environment. 
which is we need a more robust job growth in this environment so that when you waive taxes on small businesses, they have more people to contract with. So I really want to avoid, I'm not criticizing doing exemptions for small businesses. What we did from 1996 to 2008 is lower the tax burden on businesses of all kinds. And we've got the most dynamic job growth the city ever saw before COVID. So, I mean, you've done a great job with that. And it's like, you know, when you get a windfall, right? Do you spend it all on pizza and a television or do you also improve your house, right? So, I mean, all I'm saying is take some of the, that was our recommendation pre-COVID, the world has changed now. But when you're allocating a scarce pie, definitely we need to focus on need social services, absolutely. But we also need to set aside some for economic development and investment and minority business financing. But we also need to set aside some to make a more competitive environment because that will grow the pie bigger for everyone. All three are important. And, and I agree, all three are important. Um, the challenge that I've seen historically um, from this city because we have a finite amount of resources and a significant amount of need, especially when we have such a high poverty rate. From a policy perspective, you know, we've put the vast majority of those resources, even in times of better economic fortune, on those um, public um, uh, assistance type of initiatives and less on the economic efforts as well as the tax cutting that you've talked about and right. even economic stimulus. Uh, and that's part of been one of the, the major challenges I think with this policy debate is that because, it, because we have such a high level of poverty, there's a, a additional focus on those dollars going there, um, which yes, does help, but the areas of economic growth and tax policy, we provide some, but from my perspective, not enough in order to really make create to really grow um, jobs in the city of Philadelphia, which ultimately would impact the poverty rate in our city. Exactly, and I think that's I, been I, part of the challenge. No, no I, I think you're defining it well, and I know you know the need is compelling and it's understandable, but we have to get out of these either or choices. I mean, we are all suffering from this insanely polarized political environment on all levels. It's not either or. We need to help people, we need to educate people, we need to train people, and we need to grow the economy and grow black businesses and minority businesses. And the sooner we can get out of this either or conversation into saying, we're gonna save the city by growing jobs and helping people in need, the healthier we'll be as a city. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, for Mr. Levy. Again, uh, Paul, thank you for uh, your interest and your help in this matter. Uh, we have a long way to go, obviously, and um, hopefully we'll continue to work on this and uh, get some positive results. Thank you. Thank um, you Mr. very much for the opportunity. Mr. McMonagall, could you please read the list of the next panel? Sure. Panel consists of Sylvie Gallier, Gallier Howard, Jennifer Rodriguez, Nick Shinoy, I apologize for any mispronunciations. Kendra Moore and Jabari Jones. Uh, before we start with the next uh, group of testifiers, uh, Paul, if you're unable to uh, to unshare your screen, um, I guess we'll have uh, Sylvie if you want to come up first, if you're available, and then uh, we'll sure. go down a list of Jennifer, Nick, Kendra, and then uh, Jabari. Have I stopped sharing? I'm sorry. Yes, very okay. good. Thank you. My apologies. Okay. I uh, didn't want I didn't so want to interfere with Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I can kick us off. Um, okay. good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sylvie Galley Howard. I'm acting um, commerce director. Um, you have my testimony in writing, so I'm gonna just skip down past uh, where I sort of repeat some of what um Pew and Center City District of um, Pollington went over. Um, this is, you know, a really, really important topic and clearly we have so much work to do. Um, Commerce has always been committed to supporting and investing in small and minority owned businesses. We seek to foster the creation and growth of these businesses by providing direct grants, 
funding technical assistance, creating access to city contracts, and also strengthening the entrepreneurial ecosystem through partnerships with our chambers, business associations, CDCs, and bids. In light of the COVID-19 crisis, which is disproportionately impacting minority communities, and the need for us to be laser focused with our limited resources, we're doubling down on this commitment to our small and minority owned businesses. Here are some of the recent investments we've made to support small and minority owned businesses and help them through this challenging time. The city committed $20 million of CARES funding to the PA statewide small business relief program to help small businesses in Philadelphia weather the continuing effects of the pandemic. We expect to support about 1,000 businesses and the average grant size will be between 15,000 and 20,000 per business. And, and I'm sure um, for the, that you are all following that, that the vast majority of these grants are going to historically disadvantaged businesses and minority businesses. Approximately $7 million of the city's CARES money out of a total of more than 13 million went to the Small Business Relief Fund launched in partnership with PIDC. Over 2,000 businesses were supported with a combination of grants between $2,500 and $25,000 and zero interest loans up to $100,000. 66% of these businesses were minority owned, 32% were women owned, and 58% were located in low to moderate income areas. We also committed over 1.3 million to restore and reopen a grant program launched in partnership with the Merchants Fund in June to help businesses in low income areas that were damaged by the civil unrest in the wake of George Floyd's tragic death. Thanks to a contribution from the Merchants Fund, and additional fundraising, this program deployed a total of over 1.5 million to to 186 businesses, 91% of which are minority owned and 75% of which are immigrant owned. Partnering with North Broad Renaissance, we launched a campaign and provided guidance and resources to help businesses reopen with care while providing and distributing industry specific guidance to ensure businesses could reopen safely. Our investment of over $300,000 was possible because of the support of city council, so thank you, and allowed us to assemble 10,000 PPE kits that were distributed to businesses, mainly on neighborhood commercial corridors throughout the city. Nearly all of the supplies were manufactured and purchased locally by minority or women owned businesses. In addition to these recent investments, we also have ongoing annual commitments and programs that are targeted to support small businesses, such as our corridor management CDC tax credit program and CDC economic development support grants. Investments have remained steady with 48 CDCs and community organizations supported. And that, that 48 number is for the uh, CDC tax credit and economic development support grants. Uh, the storefront improvement program is funded at $360,000 in fiscal year 21. The in-store forgivable loan program is funded at half a million dollars in FY21. The business technical assistance program was increased um, in funding to 1.5 million and that's from about 900,000 um, in FY20 with an emphasis on tax preparedness and e-commerce. And this is because of the um, impact of the pandemic. Our Biz Coach program is continuing to contract for one-on-one -on -one support for businesses seeking to access city programs like SIP or in-store. Our commercial real estate acquisition fund is new this year, approximately one million to be contracted with two local CDFIs to create, a, to create as it's for existing business owners to purchase their storefront building. The taking care of business is our expanded commercial corridor cleaning program with workforce and local business contracting goals and we're investing seven million dollars in fy21 the work that we do with pidc our partner economic development agency is also critical here are some of the recent investments we've made in small minority owned businesses through pidc in the last year we made a one million dollar equity investment in minority entrepreneurship to help establish a loan fund for minority businesses along with funding for ongoing evaluation of this program with additional CDBG dollars, we're committing $2 million to PIDC's small business lending program to support activities that would not otherwise occur on affordable terms, and a portion of it will be put towards loans for very hard to serve clients based on public benefit and equitable access to capital. Another $2.1 million in CDBG is allocated to PIDC for neighborhood real estate development project lending. And of course, our Office of Economic Opportunity works to ensure that minority owned businesses have fair opportunities to benefit from city contracts. In FY19, OEO ensured that over $600 million of city and quasi-governmental spending went to minority women or disabled-owned 
enterprises. We also work to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem by investing more than half a million dollars collectively in organizations such as the African American Chamber of Commerce, the Asian American Chamber of Commerce, the CEO Council for Growth, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and the Independence Business Alliance. Various efforts have been undertaken to increase the participation of minority women disabled owned firms, including the early success of the emerging vendor program, EVP, with Rebuild and oversight committees, as well as continued growth of the OEO registry. The EVP program places owners on the path to becoming a certified minority or women owned business by allowing participants to count towards diversity goals on rebuild contracts while providing the business with technical assistance to work towards their permanent certification. To date, there are 33 emerging vendors, including seven with executed contracts and five that have become certified. In addition, OEO recently launched a new mentor protege program is in construction, which aims to connect large majority firms with smaller minority owned firms for mentoring and guidance to scale. The program will allow small firms to hone skills, strengthen their back end, secure introductions to key people in their industry, and potentially even work with their mentor on a contract. Small businesses are critical to our communities, and that's why we'll always be here to make sure they are set up for success. We are in the final stages of an assessment of our entrepreneurial ecosystem being funded by United Way, which will provide recommendations for the city to support a continuum of services aimed at supporting the creation and growth of minority owned firms in Philadelphia. The investments outlined above totaling more than 46 million are critical to ensuring the future prosperity of minority owned businesses and inclusive growth in historically disadvantaged communities. Inclusive economic growth plays a critical role in poverty alleviation and economic mobility for our residents. However, we certainly took note that the CCD study shows that Philadelphia far underspends in small business development as compared to our peer cities. And this leads to fewer business startups, especially in our minority communities. Given the strain on the city's finances due to COVID-19, we must leverage private sector and philanthropic resources to increase our investment in small business growth. And even as we recover economically from the pandemic, the city of Philadelphia must ensure that small business development is an ongoing priority. We must also be thinking about and planning for what the world will look like on the other side of this crisis and the type of tax structure our city will need to prosper in that world. We should be prepared to challenge the state, the state's uniformity clause and work together to build a simpler, more progressive tax structure that lays the groundwork for growth while also funding the services our residents expect and deserve from their local government. Our guiding vision for economic recovery is to emerge into a post COVID world with a more inclusive, robust economy that will help ensure long term prosperity for all. And to make that a reality, we'll all need to be incredibly committed to the challenging work ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and we know this has been a challenge and I do want to um, commend you and your team for all the work you have done to uh, try to get whatever subsidies we have um, to the small businesses that are out there. And it's been a challenge, but uh, I want to thank you for all your hard work. And I know we have a lot more work to do, but uh, we appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, questions for Sylvia before we go to Jennifer? Mr. Chair? Yes. Yes, my apologies. I couldn't get up the chat quick enough, but I just wanted to thank Sylvie uh, and her team for all of their work and for their partnership. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think there is somebody on the chat there. Uh, uh, Council Member Dom? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sylvie, and thank you to the Commerce Department. A couple of quick questions, Sylvie. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has a McKinsey-led uh, report. Do you have any idea or are you, are you involved in this? And could you speak to what they're suggesting and uh, what the recommendations might be from that report? Yeah, absolutely, sure. Um, I've been very involved in that process. Um, I was sort of part of the forming of that task force and, and working with McKinsey in terms of how we structured the whole process. Um, and and I participated in the majority of the meetings that took place for those subcommittees. Um, you know, a lot of times just sitting in. Um, and and so I'm very familiar that about there's six kind of primary objectives. Three of them are more health related, and then um, the other three are related really to um, hiring, sort of skills based, not just based on credentials um, or experience, and and also um, buying black, brown, and local. Um, so I, I'm encouraged by 
what you know what came out of that and um, there's a lot of work to do there too but we need the private sector to make those commitments and to um, to invest and hire and, and contract with minority firms in order to move the needle did the McKinsey report talk about the challenges in the in this in the city of Philadelphia regarding the uh, black and brown businesses and other businesses and the low growth rate did they cover that at all um, they certainly, um, so I, I, I've read a few different McKinsey studies. They've certainly done studies on the, the fact that um, minority owned firms have recovered more slowly in past recessions and are currently um, much more heavily impacted um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, so I know, I know that that is research that they did, I think for, for this, but also prior to the chambers, um, you know, hiring them as well. And, and in terms of specifically some of the things that came out in the Center City District and the Pew Report, I don't think all of those things were necessarily in the McKinsey Report, but you know, some definitely the disparities, the disparities between Black and Latinx uh, businesses and white businesses is sort of coming up in every single, every single report out there, um, and you know, so it's just constantly reinforced and something that we have to be really, really focused on. And, and did the chamber's report address at all our tax structure and the lack of investment in our tax structure? Um, I do not recall. I I don't recall. Okay. One last question or comment. I was on a panel last. No, I was listening to a, a forum, I guess, last week, and they were talking about the minority-based contracting with the city, and a few people. And I've heard this before, and I'm sure you've heard. It. I'm just trying to figure out how we solve it. A lot of small businesses are having difficulty dealing with the city because the rate of our paying their bills is so slow. How can we work to speed up that process? Because for small businesses, when you don't pay their bill, they suffer. They, can, they can't carry you know, contracts with the city of Philadelphia if we don't pay them relatively quickly. Yeah, I know that we actually have an initiative in place that the CAO is leading with the procurement department around vendor pay and how to speed up vendor pay. So, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of different steps in that process, but I know that we that there has been progress made on that and that there is an initiative um, that I've heard is pretty promising around that. Okay, well, thank you, Sylvie. Thank you to the Commerce Department and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Dom, and uh, appreciate your testimony, Sylvia. Um, Jennifer, uh, if you just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure, my name is Jennifer Rodriguez. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, testimony has been provided in writing, so I will just uh, really just go through some highlights. I know that we've been here already for a long time. Um, so for the past three decades, the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has been the leading voice promoting and uh, developing, promoting and advocating for Hispanic businesses in the Greater Philadelphia region. Um, you know, as a result of the effects of COVID-19 in our economy, and in particularly our minority owned businesses, we at the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber have developed a response strategy titled Recalibrate, Retool, Restart. Under this initiative, we have realigned our current programs and have created new ones to help Latino owned businesses recover from the impact of COVID-19, pos positioning them for the successful reintegration into the economy on the new normal. This past week, we just undertook Dine Latino Restaurant Week, a promotional campaign for his Hispanic owned business restaurants that we coupled with marketing and operations technical assistance. Participating restaurants will also be invited to apply for a micro grant program from our Latinx Small Business Relief Fund. At GPHCC, we firmly believe that entrepreneurship is one of the keys to solving the inequity that hampers the growth and development of poor and underrepresented communities. It is a fact that small businesses are the greatest source of employment growth. It is also true that most new jobs are not created by large corporations. Most new jobs are created incrementally the old fashioned way by small businesses with fewer than 250 employees. In other words, the nation's job creators and the region's job creators are the construction firms, coffee roasters, auto repair shops, restaurants and grocers located in our neighborhoods. And increasingly, those creating jobs are Latino entrepreneurs. And if job creation is one of the keys to building wealth, and if small businesses are the true engine of growth in your economy, 
then we should be hyper focused on helping them grow. Latinos, for example, are starting businesses at three times the rate of the general population, creating over 4 million businesses in the country. If just a fraction of them were to grow modestly by one or two employees, we could add thousands of new jobs in the neighborhoods that need them most. But we are challenged by the fact that Hispanic businesses start smaller and remain smaller even as they mature, with only two to three percent of businesses reaching one million dollars or more in sales. In Philadelphia, our research shows that only 700 out of a total of 12,500 businesses are employer firms. So by not scaling, we miss the opportunity to create jobs and wealth. It costs our communities when minority owned businesses do not scale up. To successfully scale, businesses need a favorable business environment, business management know-how, access to financing options, and good quality networks for business development and problem solving. At GPHCC, we are unique, uniquely positioned to cultivate an ecosystem that will help businesses grow. We advocate for policies as a chamber of commerce, we advocate for policies that support that growth. We curate networks and build social capital centered on the needs of entrepreneurs, and we match businesses with procurement leads, with resources and capital providers. Last year, we were selected by Interice, a national organization dedicated to scaling business owned by people of color to pilot Accelerate Latinx, a seven month intensive entrepreneurship education program with a bilingual curriculum. I am pleased to say that we graduated 15 out of 18 participants and that these businesses are prepared to recalibrate their plans to meet the challenges of the pandemic. In fact, three of the graduates are scaling much faster today than they had projected. And the others have been able to steady their operations and have a positive six month outlook on their enterprises. Programs like Accelerate Latinx are costly and we are looking uh, to fundraise, uh, to be able to raise the $100,000 necessary to run a second cohort. But we have learned that this type of intensive peer-based learning is what many of our entrepreneurs need in order to take their businesses to the next level. This program is not only about this, their business assessment or about learning how to analyze the organization's financials or about refining the business's marketing strategy. It is also about building strategic thinking, building social capital and doing business with your peers. It is about building a strong entrepreneur network and an ecosystem in our community. So at GPACC, we are committed to nurturing and strengthening this ecosystem through partnerships that will help us turn self-employed entrepreneurs into our employer firms and to scale up Latino owned businesses in order to build wealth in the Latino community. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, appreciate your testimony. Um, as you work with a lot of the businesses uh, through this struggle. Do you see what we as a city could do better? Yes. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so look, right this morning, uh, the diverse chambers of commerce got together and held a networking breakfast uh, of sorts through, you know, remotely with, um, there were about 70 uh, individuals there. And one of the things that we hear over and over and over is that the businesses really need um, help. It's interesting because capital is what we talk about, but businesses need expertise more than anything. I think um, businesses need to, they recognize that they need uh, to invest in marketing. They need to invest in their operations. Uh, they need to invest in a lot of administration and a lot of the, the back office work that they just simply do not have the capacity to undertake. Uh, we talk a lot about businesses that want to do uh, 
want to move from this business to consumer that we're talking about to a business to business relationship with this, which tends to be more profitable. I talk in moving up the hierarchy of the supply chain, right? right. Um, but they're having trouble doing so because to do that, they need to be able to prepare marketing materials. To do that, they need to be able to have uh, uh, capability statements. They might need to get certified. And the time and effort and the cost of doing that is really hard for a business to undertake as much as they may want to do that work. I often talk about social capital. Um, and while we talk a lot about the flexibility of capital needed, and we talk about it, about needing equity capital to be infused into uh, black and brown businesses, which absolutely needs to be done. There's not enough of that here in our region or in our city. Um, there is a lot of pro bono work and um, and work that is that firms that are white firms and white businesses have access to because they have such rich social networks. So think about the friend of the friend that has an attorney that can draw the legal papers. Think about the friend of a friend that's a bookkeeper, an accountant, and can do the books for a year while you get up. Think about the carpenter or the architect or the expediter. Think about that network of people that you need to start and grow in business and how few of those people are available in the um, in communities that are more disadvantaged. And we're asking Latino, black and brown uh, entrepreneurs to pay retail price for those services. And really that is very costly. It is very difficult for businesses that are starting up or scaling up to pay full price for a web designer, for a branding marketing agency, um, for, for legal services, for accounting services. So we're, we are seeing that is the operations and really helping them with that, that is a foundation for that business to grow. And intensive programs like Goldman Sachs 10,000, like Accelerate Latinx, build the social capital and make sure that businesses can do business with one another. Um, the second thing I would say is that not all sizes fit all. And we tend to talk about small businesses very broadly we need a much more industry sector approach to the work that we're doing. Not every industry sector behaves the same way. Not every industry sector has the same barriers to entry or business models. And we really need to think about what industry sectors are black and brown and other diverse businesses strong in and how can we help them scale up and we need to think about what are those industry sectors where we should have more presence of black and brown and disadvantaged businesses and figure out how to increase the density of business there. Um, and so, I, look, I, I can go on forever. But those are some of the things that I think well, about often. And I appreciate that because it's something that we need to hear and uh, something that we need to work on and continue to work on. Uh, Councilmember Dom? Did you have a question for Jen or was that? Yes, no, that's, yeah, that's good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jennifer, for your testimony today. Just a couple quick questions. Would you have any idea for your businesses? What has a bigger impact? Is it the net income or the gross receipts tax of the two, you know, the BERT taxes? I, you know, I think gross receipts tax probably, but really businesses do not complain that much about taxes. They complain about the process of doing business with the city. For every day that somebody complains about a tax, I have three more businesses that are complaining about how difficult it is to do business with the city, to get paperwork through the city, to get feedback on the status of requests from the city. So. Um, I think what businesses are looking for is fair value for the taxes that they pay. So right now, you're, you're, a lot of your businesses are having difficulties navigating through the uh, paperwork of the what city. What we're hearing is that as businesses are looking to pivot and think about a grocer that wants to start selling you know, prepared foods in order to increase their margins and they're looking for approvals, um, that there seems to be a uh, backlog of 
of permits and approvers and licensing, um, you know, back in the city. And they're really desperately looking to open new, re new sources of revenue, right? And so getting approvals uh, is becoming a bit difficult. Um, we're hearing that, um, as was reported earlier, that um, outdoor outdoor seating for restaurants and the expedited service and the and the elimination of the fee to do outdoor dining is something that we want to see uh, expanded. Um, the the application process was significantly simplified, and I think that that was a very good move. Um, something that we would like to see uh, permanently. Okay, I mean, uh, right now, I, you know. I always thought I thought we were going to look at doing this. We should have like people who work in the city who can be like almost I'm going to call an ambassador of a small business where they call this one person and they take them through all the processes until the, the business opens up. And that's their ambassador through the whole process. And I know Commerce Department probably is, I think, working on that or has a plan for that. But that's really important because I can tell you from dealing with the city, it can be a nightmare. And uh, that that person, you know, that person can help you get through that nightmare because most people don't know how to get through the nightmare. Well, I mean, I think what happens is we are forcing small businesses to hire accountants at $100 an hour to do that work, right? And it takes a long time to do the work and the accountant needs to build back. And so the idea that so much of that interface between business and city has to it invariably requires somebody that you need to pay a middleman fee, if you will, right? right. Uh, when things that should be simple enough for somebody to do on their own and, and do it in a predictable way. Uh, and when you have a question that that question is answered and that you have a sense of when is the process going to end. If, right, if I help. may, um, council member, I just wanna, I do wanna highlight just for people's knowledge that um, we've just created a business response team. So I think everyone here is a of Office of Business Services, which answers sort of like the 311 for businesses. And we have uh, nine people that work in that unit and they answer calls and emails. Um, but then we also now have a business response team, which is uh, we have a woman by the name of Justine Bolkus, who's kind of a central point, and she's a liaison to all the different departments. She has calls almost every day with um, LNI, Health, Streets, and they're the team that has been working on the outdoor dining, indoor dining, all that, um, streeteries, and and are going to try to continue to do that in terms of process improvement, customer service um, on everything. You know, we're, we're going to try to tackle that, um, and she's going to be leading that. So process improvement is is something that I think should be a priority in order to ensure that there's a friendly business environment. And while an ambassador program would be great, the fact is that there's 12,500 Latino owned businesses. If only a fraction, and that's only Latino owned businesses, if only a fraction of them needed an ambassador, I don't know how many ambassadors we would need around the city. So the, the trick is here to create processes that are standardized, that are predictable, that are simple to follow so that um, businesses can do it on their own. And, and I think we will see a, a significant change in attitude. I totally agree with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions for Jen? Seeing then, Jen, thank you so much. And uh, we'll continue to work with you as we progress through this. Um, is, Nick, if you're available, could you just state your name for your record and proceed with your testimony? Oh uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, appreciate uh, inviting me. I'll be short. Uh, for record, uh, my name is uh, Narasimha Shinoy. I am the founder, president, and CEO of the Asian American Chamber of Commerce of Greater Philadelphia. We are a membership uh, nonprofit organization that serves Asian businesses, individual entrepreneurs, and nonprofit organizations for the growth of economy and employment in greater Philadelphia area. Majority of Asian owners in Philadelphia are immigrants, came to seek better life and to pursue American dream. Those who are not educated, culturally different and face language barriers are in business for their survival. It's our mission to help such businesses to survive and grow, to help themselves and uh, create a uh, job for others. The 
first step to increasing job growth and reducing the city poverty rate is making it easier for entrepreneurs to start a business and create employment in their neighborhoods. Starting and running a business is hard enough and it should not be made harder by unnecessary bur regulations and burdensome uh, red tapes. A few charitable trust uh, and center city report are not very encouraging for minority business community. City of Philadelphia has underperformed in startup and growth of small and minority businesses. City Council must work together for business friendly regulations to encourage businesses start up and grow. COVID-19 has a drastic effect on minority businesses. Many of them have already closed and uh, more to do so. Add to that, damage due to riots during the protests have further devastated this micro business community. Businesses are, are not confident that this is not going to happen again and the ability of city to protect their business. This will considerably slow down the restart of existing businesses and slow down new startups. City must work hard to overcome their fear and build confidence in business community through business friendly environment. As we are in the recovery phase, there is an urgent need to educate immigrant businesses to operate their businesses safely, especially owners with limited language proficiency. City needs to increase efforts to communicate legislative requirements which they put on their businesses. Many micro businesses are not aware that they are violating regulations and, and are hurt by fines and closures further increasing the risk of endangering the safety of their customers. Chamber is working with the diversified multicultural Asian business community with limited resources. More effort and resources should be dedicated to this effort. We are committed to work with the administration to help small and micro businesses in the Asian American community. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you so much for your testimony. And um, I want to ask you the same question. I guess we asked Jennifer if you see, uh, as far as the businesses are concerned, um, what we in the city can be doing better to help them. I, th I think the Commerce Department doing a lot of it. Uh, again, it's never enough. Um, but I think the building the confidence level, especially with the Asian community, who, you know, the the immigrant came from different countries with a different level of uh, administration and most of them did not come from a democratic process. Uh, so they're kind of uh, uh, not very uh, supportive of the authorities, so to speak, and they have fear, they have a fear of authorities. So that is something uh, as our community, we need to overcome that, uh, that fear. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why uh, the Asian uh, businesses are not responding uh, properly to the uh, legislative matters because number one, they are afraid to understand it. Uh, so I think the creating a friendly environment uh, is uh, very crucial. Uh, that should be a key. Uh, even Jennifer mentioned that the same issue. Uh, again, uh, money always helps. Uh, boots <laughs> on the ground, uh, you know, especially for the Asian community, we have different different ethnic groups. Uh, so we, you know, we don't have a one fits all thing. We have to have seven or eight fits to one thing. So, uh, so additional resources will help, which is what we are working on. And also uh, the community does not, the businesses do not come to you. You have to go to them. So we are opening an office in South Philly. We just got a grant to do so. Uh, we can try to see, you know, uh, hey, uh, to build up their confidence uh, so they can come and talk to us uh, to get some help. There's plenty of help available if they really wish us. Well, I, I appreciate that because then, um, and we know sometimes some of the concerns we get from the community, not only just starting up in the process of, of getting going, but then as they're opening and how to help them comply, whether it's L and I or health and the language barrier that's there, but you know, once they are up and running, how do we make sure that they know what the rules are, and especially during this COVID with the con rules constantly changing, 
sometimes we get a lot of concerns from the community saying that we didn't know this and, and now you know we're here but we want to comply and you know i think that's you know it's something we need to work on too as a city to to help these folks understand that you know we want you to be in business and instead of saying we're going to shut you down saying we're going to help you stay open and i think we got to do a better job of that yes sir and also the cultural background you know these people come from the countries where uh, uh they're not used to these kind of business uh, procedures you know, um, I come from India, and if you're a small business, you know, you just don't have any regulations. You know, just do the business, cash business, and done with. <laughs> so when, when 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 you come to this country, you expect the same thing. So there is an educational process, uh, you know, needs to be done. Uh, those who are here for many, many years, they do tend to follow it. But the new people, when they come new, they need the whole process, the whole education uh, process we need to redo all over again you know all right well i, I appreciate that and then uh, we we know we have a lot more work to do but we appreciate your partnership and then working with all the chambers to help us get the word out and uh, especially during when we had the subsidies available how do we disseminate that information to everybody in so many languages yes. and the chambers were a big help and a part of that so thank you so much thank uh you, is there any, any other questions Seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Kendra, if you wanna just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure thing. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kendra Moore, the Government Relations Manager for the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia. Um, I know folks talked a lot about the data and statistics earlier today. Uh, we also submitted some lengthy testimony that contains our analysis of that data. Um, so I'll skip that for everyone's um, time management purposes here and just kind of get into it. Um, so we've had a number of conversations with our members um, almost on a weekly basis throughout the pandemic um, and have really heard that in order to foster the economic resilience and growth that stem from a robust and diverse independent business community, it's really critical that government prioritize and incentivize local independent businesses to start grow and thrive as we chart this recovery. Um, and as part of this effort, we must intentionally support black and other minority owned businesses, which really serve as anchors for more equitable and inclusive wealth creation, uh, certainly healthier communities and a greener city. And SBN, our membership and partners um, support and we advocate for strategies and policies at both the local and the state levels to achieve these goals. Um, so in terms of solutions and things that we've been talking a lot about over the last few months, um, I'll just start with taxes. I mean, we recognize the uniformity clause issue. That's something that we're willing to work on um, and advocate for changes at the state level. So you have a partner um, in us in that. Um, one area of reform is is uh, the lack of parity in the the city's business tax structure so we're hearing that a lot um a significant portion of the city's revenue comes from business related taxes and smaller businesses dis disproportionately bear the brunt of these taxes and as pew's report shows between 2015 and 2017 philly's largest businesses contributed 98 percent of total reported business receipts yet only contributed half of the city's overall business tax revenue. Conversely, of course, the small and mid-sized businesses contributed 2% of total reported receipts and yet contributed half of the city's overall business taxes. While this may have been slowly shifting and, you know, we love to see more of that. It points to the need for the city to create a more balanced way to draw in revenue. Um, and relatedly, a previous Pew report highlighted that Philly's business tax structure is frequently cited as one reason for the city's relatively weak job creation record over the past few decades. I mean, I, I think we, we spoke about this today. Um, you know, only 11 of the 30 largest U.S. cities tax corporate profits or revenue, and only Philadelphia taxes both. 
Um, so we would really do well to look at best practices in cities with high rates of local businesses per capita, high rates of business ownership in historically marginalized communities, and low rates of poverty, and bring those policies to Philadelphia. That's a, a no-brainer. Um, I think everyone's on the, the same page with trying to do right by that. Um, in addition, our members also call out uh, the inequitable nature of other tax policies. I know it's certainly controversial and not an easy thing to tackle, but you know we're hearing tax abatement, other local tax credits and incentives that disproportionately favor large multinational enterprises or anchor institutions over local businesses continue to be on the minds of folks struggling to keep their businesses open, particularly in business corridors. Um, and as you probably have noticed, because of increasing financial pressures on local governments, many municipalities are considering changing the voluntary nature of the payments in lieu of taxes or pilot um, programs uh, uh, to be able to draw in um, new sources of revenue. Um, perhaps I'll just add a few more, you know, recommendations, solutions that that certainly you've heard of um, from us and, and others over the coming or the past months. Um, continued need for financial support through gr grants and low interest loans. Um, we also applaud the city's action early in the pandemic to extend emergency microloans and other assistance, um, including efforts to prompt uh, financial institutions to offer loan forgiveness. Um, that 20 million that Sylvie mentioned earlier, certainly um, folks are excited about that. Um, financial support for fair accessible credits, especially to businesses owned by individuals from historically marginalized back backgrounds will remain an essential component of our recovery. Um, I want to also point out, however, though, that our members see, see access to credit as and workforce development as pieces of a larger puzzle um, to solve the larger puzzle here. They're, they're not saying, you know, just access to credit alone is going to get us there. They're seeing it as, you know, one component or one element in a broader holistic set of solutions um, to bring about a supportive economic ecosystem. Other solutions would include a temporary moratorium on commercial evictions, commercial rent protections, improved zoning, um, an intentional focus on local business development, which was also discussed today. And of course, uh, better processes, procedures, and customer service for business owners interfacing with the city, as my colleagues Nick and Jennifer had highlighted. And perhaps this last point will be resolved through the business response team that Sylvie mentioned. Um, so we, we certainly recognize as partners in this journey, there's no single solution that will solve this economic crisis. Um, and heed the calls for more equitable and inclusive growth. However, we see these recommendations as kind of part of that roadmap toward both short-term relief and long-term sustainable growth. Um, we remain committed to working with you. So happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for your testimony and uh, thank you also for uh, summarizing it. Uh, you did have a lot of data in your uh, in your written testimony. So we appreciate that. And that will be a display for the record. Um, so, and then we're talking about, I mean, I think council member Dom had asked a question. Um, do you see any of the burdens beside the process of doing this? Is there burdens as far as taxes on any of these businesses? I mean, certainly w without having, you know, details as to say if the NPT versus BERT, like which ones are the most burdensome, you know, we're just hearing kind of writ large, like the city needs to do something to bring about a more equitable tax structure, whether that's through, you know, creative solutions without changing um, the uniformity clause through incentives or other credits, like improving or expanding those programs, or, you know, going right for it and, and you know, finding a way to work with the state legislature to get us where we need to be um, with that clause. So um, it, it's, 
I, I would say that it's it's kind of a, a range of 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 tax related issues that folks are facing. Also, depending on where they are in the city, um, you know, if they're if they're in you the um, like close to universities, you know, they may have a very different perspective on pilot than than others that aren't right there in that neighborhood and seeing you know seeing it every day. So. Um, it, it's a it's a tough tough uh, area to tackle reform. Uh, taxes are never easy at any time, especially now. But really seeing that and hearing it on a regular basis from the membership. Well, thank you, and we agree it is a tough issue. <laughs> and uh, I wish we had all the answers. But uh, thank you for your testimony, uh, Councilmember Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Kendra, for your testimony and for the work of the Sustainable Business Network. Uh, it's been my pleasure to work with you all over the years. Uh, really quickly, I just wanted to uh, talk about uh, our green economy and recovery as we think about how we recover from COVID-19. Uh, and for me, growing the number of business owners of color uh, in green industries is something I would like to see. So are you offering uh, specific supports to business owners of color in green industries? Uh, and if so, what are they? And do you have any scalable solutions uh, to making green industries more diverse and more inclusive of people of color? Because I think that will be an important part of our recovery uh, moving forward. Thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, it's a great question, and certainly with the last six months of civil unrest and the pandemic upon us, um, SBN has looked to reform its membership model to make it more inclusive. We have changed to a sliding scale model based on um, businesses' revenue, including the last 12 months, so that would be um, inclusive of pandemic losses, um, and our strategically doing outreach to businesses um, that normally would not have had kind of a seat at the table but had been you know always practicing you know sustainability they just may be calling it something else um, so so that said we're kicking off uh, a rebuild series an annual one-year rebuild series um, on how to rebuild with equity and inclusion, targeting local businesses and sharing practices um, and learning from them um, on how to rebuild with the tenants of equity and sustainability and inclusion um, for the green economy. Towards your point on green infrastructure, as you probably know and, and others here, um, you know, we have supported an initiative on green stormwater for several years and are eager to expand um, that for a number of reasons, but really do see that the growth in the green economy, whether it's in energy or water infrastructure, green technology in general, has a lot of potential, not just in Philadelphia, but statewide. Um, there was a recent report that just came out from um, E2, um, and they are looking at, you know, some pretty impressive growth rates for clean energy across the state, far and above, um, you know, your traditional gray sources of infrastructure. So that is an area where I think we could invest more in, especially in these training programs and folks who already have been doing it and have that knowledge um, and bring them into that conversation. No, thank you so much for that response. And as a follow up, I wanted to ask you what you think we should be doing from a city government perspective to ensure that we are supporting that type of growth, because that's an industry where uh, we typically don't have a lot of minorities, but particularly African Americans in that field. How do we try to center them in this process so that, you know, when it's all said and done, we're not looking at the same percentages that we're faced with now? I think that's that's a great question. I think it's going to be intentional targeting of folks who have that knowledge and training and expertise. They are out there um, and that could be through tax credits or preferential contracting and procurement. Um, it could also be through this protege program um, and other um, sort of entrepreneurial uh, partnership programs through perhaps the Office of Sustainability or water. Um, there are these projects and some shovel 
travel ready that are that are out there, of course, dependent on revenues um, that could involve local contractors from black and brown communities. Um, I think it's a matter of intentionally going after those and having those conversations and reaching out to corridor managers who's involved in this. Um, and, and we're trying to do the exact same thing. It's it certainly isn't an overnight thing, um, but we also want to be mindful. And this is something our partners have have expressed it's it's not just about training and protege partnerships those things are very important that's one piece of it um but there are folks who who have the expertise um and can contribute and perhaps they were just left out of the conversation or having trouble like networking and getting into it so it's a, a holistic thing a lot of things need to be done okay Thank you so much for that response. I want to explore that further with you uh, offline uh, at another time because I was recently reading an article about the expansion of the landscaping industry and thinking about contractors in that particular industry and how we can try to help them pivot uh, to working on green infrastructure projects, things of that nature and how we can kind of help give individuals the tools to uh, you know, have a different model uh, within their business. So I want to talk to you about that more offline so we can figure out the best way uh, to help individuals grow uh, their capacity or even pivot to uh, the green economy. Thank you so much and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Dom. Thank you, uh, Chairman Squilla and Kendra, thank you for your testimony on behalf of SBN. And I, I wanted to just bring up this issue of taxation because I do think it plays, it's one of the, the problems with developing economy. I mean, clearly we heard testimony today that said of the top five cities on the East Coast, we're the lowest in entrepreneurial business creation in all categories, black and brown, in every category we're the lowest pretty much and across the board. But here's an interesting fact that my office researched of, I guess, 25 or 30 cities across the country. Um, we have a local net income tax, okay? But we also have a state net income tax. And when you add them up, New York City is at 17.2, we're at 16.1, and everyone else is below 10. So if you're thinking about business here, that's a big disincentive. And you know, we heard the story of investing in our tax structure, I guess from Paul Levy. We need to do that because right now we're not competitive. I mean, Boston's at eight, we're at 16.19. Chicago's at 9.5, Baltimore's at 8.25. We're really out of the ballpark here. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that and see if we're on the right track or not. Yeah, um, thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, as you as you heard um, from from my testimony and, and folks that we've talked to in our in our membership, certainly taxes are it comes up again and again. Um, and looking back and at former testimony that SBN has given in preparation for today, certainly it has been an issue for a long time. And I guess for for us, it's it's not. You know, it's not necessarily about increasing taxes on one side and, you know, decreasing it for small and mid-sized businesses, but it's a matter of looking at the parity, you know, um, it, where where could we, we build up um, the revenue base, maybe it is through expansion and providing other ways for businesses to, ve to develop so that, you know, the burden can be decreased or at least um, dispersed across a larger segment. Um, I'm not going to say that that uh, the businesses in our network are, you know, are particularly um, happy that they they have to pay um, both the, the MPT and BERT. I mean, certainly that's that's they're against that. They think that it's it's excessive, um, but realize that you know revenue has to come from somewhere. So um, happy to explore what those options might look like. Um, you know, obviously large corporations and other um, multinationals in in the in the city have 
you know, resources that small and medium sized businesses don't have. As Jennifer mentioned, this includes like accountants and lawyers who can identify loopholes and take advantage of tax credits that the, the smaller shops just aren't going to be able to do for lack of time, resources, energy, education. So um, it may be a matter of just kind of looking at how they can improve those um, areas of expertise so that they can take advantage, more advantage of the tax credits that are available to them. Well, thank you today. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Dom. Uh, if there's no other questions, thank you, Kendra, for your testimony. Um, Jabari, if you're available, if you want to just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure. So for the record, uh, my name is Jabari Jones. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, and all the members of uh, City Council on this call. Uh, my name is Jabari Jones, and I serve as the president of the West Philadelphia Corridor Collaborative, which is the largest coalition of small businesses uh, in West Philly. Uh, we're comprised of 14 member business organizations that have a combined membership of over 2,000 small businesses that lie along many of our Main Street commercial corridors. Uh, I want to thank you all for inviting me to testify this afternoon, and I want to thank all the members of this committee uh, for their hard work in exploring the impact of the pandemic on uh, neighborhood small businesses. The COVID-19 pandemic has touched every corner of our district and it has affected businesses in every industry. Many of our neighborhood stores are currently on the verge of permanent collapse from a lack of being able to generate revenue for months, some being damaged in recent civil unrest, and others that are, have suffered significant water damage uh, from recent tropical storms and flooding. Also in our district, the decision of universities and academic institutions that switched to virtual learning has removed over 55,000 college students, faculty and professional staff from our community. These individuals and the spend that they would normally contribute to our economy, uh, has, which is normally so integral for so many small businesses, specifically along our Lancaster, Baltimore and Woodland Avenue commercial corridors has caused significant harm to our local economy as well. So with so many small businesses on the fence of, stable, of either stabilizing or permanently going out of business, the work of this committee and, and my colleague business associations and chambers of commerce is more important now than it's ever been. Um, so as we navigate these times and, and talk about how the city can further help these businesses, um, I would call on the administration as well as members of city council to consider reviewing and relaxing some of the regulations and the way that the city operates uh, as it affects small businesses so that these businesses can start generating revenue um, as soon as possible and stabilize. And I want to provide three really quick examples of uh, some things that are happening right now in our community uh, that are affecting small businesses that the city and city leaders have the ability to help. Uh, so the first is an issue that's happening in Southwest Philadelphia uh, with a business called Industrial Food Truck or IFT. Uh, it's a locally owned food, fabric, food truck fabrication facility uh, that also operates a commercial culinary kitchen. Uh, that culinary kitchen serves as the kitchen of record for 40 small business food truck vendors uh, that operate here in our city. In their situation this May, uh, when the city, uh, city services at the health department actually suspended their health uh, in inspections uh, during the pandemic, IFT ended up having its license expire uh, in the middle of the time period where the city's uh, offices had rolled back those inspections. Uh, this immediately put into jeopardy those 40 vendor food businesses that could not operate without a licensed culinary kitchen on record. Furthermore, the city's, when the city's health department did resume its inspections, IFT was denied a license renewal because of a newly installed bathroom that although had the approval of the Office of Licenses and Inspections, it had not received a, a subsequent second approval from the health department. City officials uh, expected the business owner who was following the normal construction process uh, to know and understand uh, that they had to seek additional clearances uh, from other departments after receiving a letter of, um, a letter of authorization from the Department of Licenses uh, and Inspections. During a pandemic uh, at, where the services of the health department had already been greatly limited. As a result of that denial, those 40 food trucks and the combined 100 jobs that they employ here right now today are unable to operate. 
And so that's 100 people that are in this community that won't be receiving a paycheck this week. I want to thank Councilman Dom's office for his help as he is currently working to, with us to resolve this issue. Uh, but I think that this is a prime example of how some of the city's operating uh, apparatus, as it affects small businesses, uh, works to the detriment of a lot of businesses that are currently struggling to recover. I urge the city to review some of its operations from the perspective of some of these business owners. And now more than ever, when, when businesses need to generate that revenue to be able to stabilize, uh, look at how the city can make some changes that makes it easier for these companies to operate here in our city. The second one relates to restaurants and food businesses that have been hit by the pandemic. The city's current regulations cap the occupancy indoors at 50% and outdoors, which depends typically on the length of the business's individual sidewalk. The city has also established additional restrictions on the operating times of these restaurants, requiring most of them to close by 10 p.m. Since these restaurants are already under occupancy restrictions, I would urge the members of the city council and city leaders to immediately reduce these restrictions to allow restaurants to be open till at least 11 p.m. and develop a long-term plan to further reduce these time restrictions uh, dependent on our city's COVID-19 cases as they continue to decline and stabilize. Doing so will allow these restaurants the ability to serve more patrons on any given day, generate more revenue, and ultimately help stabilize their financial position, retain employees, and be able to continue to operate. The third and final example that I, that I wanted to share today uh, it relates to requesting that the city be more intentional with the spending of relief dollars that are meant to help small businesses. As I mentioned earlier, the pandemic affects every industry, but there are some specific industries that have been unable to generate any revenue and some that even today have been unable to reopen. These industries and these businesses should be prioritized with the spending of any additional relief funds and include businesses like our event spaces, performing arts and music venues, our churches and faith and religious institutions, locally owned and small, bar, uh, small bars that do not sell food that have still not been able to reopen. I would ask that the city be intentional about prioritizing relief to these industries and also to areas geographically that have been disproportionately affected like the neighborhoods that are directly surrounding University City. And I think that that, that focus in terms of how the city spends a lot of those relief dollars not only means from the grant programs that are meant to assist small businesses, but also from the perspective of where the city awards grant dollars and the programs that the city decides to fund and how those programs need to directly relate uh, to recovery, relief, and stabilization of the many commercial corridor businesses uh, that are suffering throughout the city. Thank you again for allowing me to testify this afternoon, and I look forward to answering any questions or providing any insight that can help our, our neighborhood commercial corridor stabilize and recover from the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Jabbar, and thank you for your testimony. And, and it's, I guess it's good to hear, but bad to hear. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, we need to um, be able to look at ways where we help people to comply instead of saying, oh, we're shutting you down because you did something wrong. And, you know, sometimes we expect all these business owners to know everything about all the regulations and all the departments and it's, as we find out in, in these positions, it's not true, and we often are trying to help them navigate that. Uh, but, but it better be coming coming from the individual departments, um, and um, it's a challenge. It really is, and, and especially during COVID uh, and, and some of the challenges you, uh, you have mentioned. Um, really, there should be better ways to handle that, and I think we need to do a better job. So, thank you. I know Council Member uh, Dom, did you, did you have a uh, question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick one. Thank you, Jabari, for your testimony today. And I you know I speak on behalf of the chairman and I and all my colleagues on council. And that is that, you know, thank thank God that your organization and all the businesses are operating in the city of Philadelphia. Thank God. We want you here. We want you to succeed. Your success is our success. We need to do everything we can to help you. We want you to get through this pandemic. We don't want to lose one business. We want to make sure that you all survive. And you know, job creation and employment is so crucial to the economic base of this city. And I speak for all of us when I say this to you, thank God, thank God you're in Philadelphia and you're operating and we want more people to come to our city. So I just really appreciate every business owner. I know that so does the chairman and all my colleagues that you have, all business owners have choices, but those that are open into the city of Philadelphia really appreciate them functioning here and operating here and supporting our city. So thank you, Jabari. And, 
whatever we can do to help any of your business, I will tell you, any of my colleagues will, will go down a limb and help because we want those businesses to do well. That's just in your district, but in any district in the city, we want those businesses to survive through this pandemic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Is there any other uh, questions for uh, Jabari? And uh, I just want to add one last thing is that as you bring up these examples, I think it's good for us to see as a, as a council um, as we work with our individual departments, because, you know, a lot of times people are out there in, in the field think that when a department comes to them, they're only coming there for a problem. I think we have to change the mindset and we have to have a, a, a better a way of approaching us and say, you know what, we're coming here. Oh, we see these couple things wrong. This is what you need to do to comply. Do this. I'll be back tomorrow, so forth and so on. And then we'll be able to to get you back up and running or to do it right there. Have you correct the things that you can right away? I mean, there are some things that, you know, may need to be fixed that may have take a longer time. But um, we need we need to actually work with you so that you can tell us what those problems are. And then we need to work with our departments to make sure they they address them the same way and we're working to help people comply instead of working to help them close down. So I do I do appreciate that. And I see that we do have a quick question from uh, council member uh, Gilmore Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's just a very quick comment. I just wanted to thank Jabari for all of his work, uh, just being on the ground and always being accessible uh, to the small business owners on a number of the corridors, uh, particularly in West Philadelphia. And uh, just for all of your work uh, after the civil unrest where we all worked together very diligently uh, to ensure that we could quickly clean up uh, those corridors so we could notate for those communities that uh, they are open for business. So thank you very much for your work and also to my colleague, Council Member Dom, uh, who I know has been working with you in those businesses in that area. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else here to testify on the resolution whose name has not yet been called? Hearing none. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Council Member Squilla, Chair of the Council and Economic Development Committee. Um, I want to thank Council Member Dom for um, this hearing. A lot of great information, uh, especially not only from the various chambers that were represented, uh, as well as uh, from Jabari Jones and Nick Shinoy and Jennifer Rodriguez and um, all of the witnesses, uh, Sylvia Gaye Howard, but also the information from Thomas Ginsburg at Pew and Paul Levy. Uh, Center City District. So I look forward to having additional conversations um, on how we deal with this economic crisis, especially as we're talking about uh, the issue of minority enterprise development. And this week is Med Week. So I encourage everyone who is able to participate in Med Week. Um, this is the third, sixth annual Med Week and it provides opportunities to do the very same things that we've been talking about um, this afternoon. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, again, I want to reiterate uh, what Council Member Green had said about our panel. And, you know, we need to work together to make this happen. It, it can't happen. We can't do this on the silo. Council can't do it by themselves and the chambers can't. So we appreciate your input and looking forward to continue working with you to resolve these issues and concerns. Uh, this will conclude our business before the committee on commerce and economic development today. Thank you all very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to uh, future conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.